spring, the town of Littleton began conducting remote participation Zoom meetings pursuant to Governor Baker's emergency order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law on March 19th, 2020. Since that time, unanticipated legal concerns relating to the open meeting law have been brought to our attention by the town clerk. Excuse me, those concerns were supported by the Attorney General's office and confirmed by town council. In response to these concerns, the town will implement the following changes, which in no way prohibit any member of the public from participating in discussion and sharing information during a public meeting and will ensure that all listeners and participants have equal access to this meeting. People that join the Zoom meeting are set so their microphones are muted. If you called in by phone, please use star six or unmute your phone. So the meeting can occur in an orderly fashion. We ask that people who join keep their microphones on mute so background noises do not interfere with the meeting. If you wish to participate in the meeting, please the raise your hand function available on Zoom, or if you called in by phone, dial star nine, which will activate the raise your hand function. Meeting host will notify the chairperson of the raised hands and the chairperson will determine whether and when to allow public comment. <coughs> when called upon, participants should unmute then state their name and address. After speaking, we request the participant return their microphones back to mutes. <clears throat> okay, should, I'll just continue, Amy, until Jim arrives or Sarah. Yeah, Jim or Sarah, yeah. That, if that works for you, that works for me. Thanks. That's fine. Um, so we'd like to approve the minutes of November 2nd, 2020. Does anybody have any comments? It looks good. They look good to me. Anna, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I submitted um, uh, edits uh, to Amy um, electronically, um, and all of them were minor. Um, I did rearrange a little bit of 93 Man Manawanaki um, just to decrease the use of the word well <laughs> because um, <laughs> it talks about a dry well and then it says as well as so I just try I just simplified that so but that's also very minor um, I did insert um, in 97 Mill Road um, continued public hearing uh, it states that uh, phase one assessment had been done. I just clarified, I put chapter 21E before assessment, just to clarify that that's the type of assessment it was. Um, and I think that was the, that was the only, um, okay. I think that's, and I just clarified that um, in um, the, this is a long one, so I'm trying to get, okay, then 199 Whitcomb Avenue, Smith property discussion. Um, um, I suggested that um, pretty low down in the first paragraph, it says she was asked about what volumes and how avoid overspray. I just said what volumes will be applied and how to avoid overspray. Um, so those are just the uh, more significant ones. So you can tell that they're not very significant, but they just clarify usually. So um, that's what I suggested. That's it. Okay. Can I have a vote to approve the minutes of November 2nd? Uh, Carl Melberg, aye. Oh, Carl, we just have to make a uh, motion first. So I'll make a oh, motion. Oh, so make a motion, Andrew. I'll make a motion that we approve the meeting minutes of November 2nd, 2020 as amended. Second, anybody? I'll second. Uh, Carl Melberg, aye. 
Brian Crowley. Aye. Brian Crowley, aye. Kyle Maxfield. Kyle Maxfield, aye. Andrew Samarco. Andrew Samarco, aye. And Sarah Seward. You're muted, Sarah. Oh, she's not. Maybe at her end. Can't hear you. Something's wrong with her mic. <laughs> Sounds like. <laughs> can we take that as an eye? <laughs> she's shaking her head, okay. I think we can take that as an eye. There's right, something wrong with the it. microphone at her end. We have unanimous. <clears throat> um, administrative discussion. Eagle Scout Project, Griffin Cop. I think Griffin is here. <coughs> Griffin, would you like to make a presentation? Yes. Yeah. So uh, last time I was here. Oh, Griffin just froze. And Griffin, your mic isn't working either. You're not on mute from this end, but. Well. <clears throat> and he froze again. So we will continue and then if Griffin comes back on, if we'll- If we see uh, him moving, yeah. If Griffin comes back on, we'll listen to him. Six <laughs> 63 foster temporary fence and control of invasives using livestock. Um, I think Jen Wilson's here about that briefly. And, and this is, to, she wants to use some temporary fencing to uh, fence in uh, pigs or goats or something to control. Um, in uh, yes. Can you guys see me? That's yep. right. I'm Jen Wilson, 63 Foster Street. Um, we have a lot of knotweed in the back and it's near an intermittent stream. Um, methods so far have not really touched the um, knotweed and it's spreading significantly. So, you know, we were talking about, you know, maybe getting some livestock, either goats or pigs and a temporary electric fence around the area, which is right alongside of the stream, which um, Julie Rupp believes it's intermittent, but I haven't looked at any official um, documentation on that. Um, but, you know, that combined with this new mesh method, um, we're hoping that we can get rid of the knotweed and make the stream um, much healthier. So I, I frankly wasn't sure yep. if the commission wanted to see an RDA on this or didn't see the need. I can't hear you. We're having sound problems all over the place. <laughs> okay, sorry, can you say that again? Oh uh, yeah, I was just telling the, the <laughs> who some, I can't tell if they're frozen or they're just like not moving at all. <laughs> but I wasn't sure if they would wanna see um, an RDA filing on this. Um, or not, which I kind of assume, but I wanted to run it by you all first. I don't think we need one for that. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Andrew. I don't, I don't think we do either. I think that what I'd, I'd certainly do is I'd go out and, you know, walk the site with Jen and get an idea of. Yeah. Just try, Amy, Amy, take a look at that intermittent stream. Yeah, that gets fed, the most get fed by the, the like the swamp marsh area that's like at the intersection of Foster and Tahatawan. Is that that's where that pump gets fed from, right, Jen? Yeah, it goes um, under Foster Street behind the White House on the corner there and um, through right. the back of and our yard. Yep. yep. So yeah, probably not. Run. Is it running right now from all the rain that we've gotten or no? No, no. It, it, yeah, the marsh looks pretty low. Wait, yeah, wait. it doesn't really flow um, between, I don't know, July to December, January, February, somewhere here. It depends on the temperatures. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense to me. And do you expect this to be just for one season? Are you renting the animals or? Um, 
we if it was pigs they would be um harvested in the fall um if it's goats we have other areas we're interested in putting them in that would not be right um where the knotweed in the stream is there and what did you ask a second question just one season well i guess it depends when um the knotweed is gone as you know it's not a one year fix so it might take a little while to get rid of it um to an extent where we could actually manage it um by hand <laughs> Hi there. Sorry, Sarah Seward here. I was having a lot of issues. I think Zoom is um, kind of a little crazy tonight. Um, yeah. You had mentioned pigs. So I'm familiar with the site. The only challenge with pigs is the rooting, um, the uprooting of them. So um, historically, from my recollection in town, sheep and goats have been really um, welcomed. I don't know that we have done a lot of um, pigs with them. Um, so curious and what your experience has been with the pigs if you choose to go that route in terms of pasturing them? Uh, personally, my husband and I have not had pigs. Um, growing up, I had a pig, but um, we have, um, there's some pretty cool podcasts out there and, you know, books and we keep up to date with. Um, okay. So I know. guess my, my only question is that if you choose to go the route of pigs that we come back in for a discussion, but I, I totally support um, goat and sheep um, in, in terms of invasives. I'm not aware that the pigs will really um, help the land as much as the others, but look forward to your thoughts. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we can always let you know how it goes too. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> and that, that was part of the reason I, I thought it might be good to come in because I wasn't sure about pigs and rooting. Yep. How yep. Much rooting has been super destructive for some other um, plots of land that I'm familiar with. Not in town though. Yeah, and to be honest, I mean, there's nothing else in that area now. Um, well, actually, no, I should take that back because uh, there is some jewel weed there, which um, Julie had noted. So that could be um, one thing. But I mean, it's the previous owners seem to have like plowed, um, not weed rhizomes up to the bank. So it's like a big pile full of old stuff. And like, it's impossible to do by hand. We've done our best, but it's just um, tricky. Hey, Sarah, yep. I'll, I'll continue through the administrative discussion then if you wouldn't mind taking over after that, that would be great. Yep, for sure. I've just been on, this is my second computer on Zoom, so right, cool. trying, trying to get it going. Is, that, is Griffin yeah. back? Griffin, you back? He's back. I'm not sure if he can be back. So Gri Griffin, if you turn oh, your Griffin. video off, your audio might work better. Can right, you hear me? Now give it a shot, Griffin. Can anyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so last time I was here, we were talking about different options for uh, what to put the boardwalk on because there's issues with the telephone poles and uh, leaching chemicals into the area. And uh, mostly Mr. O'Neill, but uh, in him come up with an idea of using like, uh, like plumbing pipes, like just plastic uh, tubes uh, that we could lay the boardwalk on top of so there wouldn't really be any chemical leaching into the ground. Sort of similar to how the, the main boardwalk is constructed. I believe so, yes. Yeah, but with, with smaller pipe. Correct. So I don't know if there's any other questions or issues about that. Um, but that was basically what we were thinking about doing. So, could I interject? Yes. Um, yeah, we're gonna. I'm prepared to uh, pay for the cost of using the uh, pipe like we used on the other boardwalks at Cloverdale, and there were no issues using those. So, hopefully, there wouldn't be any issues with this project. Be okay. the uh, plastic drainage pipe. Great. Um, Griffin, if you could, I'm not sure if you've prepared for tonight, just a, a new um, design or anything that you want to share with the commission showing the, the pipe, or if it's all just going to be in the exact same place, we would just want a list of the materials. Um, not sure if any of the commissioners have any other 
questions on that? It seemed as though the location and timing and everything was appropriate. Okay, yeah. Um, I don't have a new design with the pipes being used. Um, I don't know if Mr. O'Neill has one. Yeah, the, the, the design that we submitted before would be exactly the same. Instead of using the utility poles, we would use the pipe in their place. So everything else would be the same design. Okay. Did any of the commissioners have any other questions? It sounds as though it's just being in in kind um, swap for materials. Sounds good to me. Yep, I'm, I'm good. Yep, all good. The pipes are a great idea. Great, so Griffin, we appreciate you taking that into consideration. And as always, we ask to be um, kind of kept up to date as your progress goes on. What is your, just to remind the commission what your timeline is in terms of start and finish? In a so for, uh, in a perfect world, it would have, uh, been done a while ago, but the uh, the Boy Scouts of America Council has not yet approved the project. Uh, I, I guess they're just backed up with the whole uh, situation. So I don't know if it's even going to be able to get done until next spring because if the ground freezes before, it's going to be a lot harder, maybe even like impossible to do. Um, I turn 18 in April. I can get like a one or two month extension after that. So it really... It's it's going to be done before next, like, June, or I can't get it done. So uh, and I was hoping to get it done this fall, but the uh, the Boy Scout Council did not approve it yet. Um, so hopefully next spring it's going to be a little tricky, but, yeah. Okay. So, Griffin, we wish you success with your approval. Just keep us updated, okay? Of course. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Griffin. Yeah. Hey, uh, Amy, you want to do a crest view or should we go into the 715? I'm fine. All right. All right thanks. No, it's not fine. That, that hey, was Jim. Amy? That was Jim. Um, yeah, why don't, do you want us to go to the 9, the, the 7, let's go to the 915. The mm -hmm. 715, 5 Scott Road, you want to just. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let, uh, let Sarah take over from here. Okay, so my notes are very different than what I'm, what I have here. So if you guys can bear with me for a second. So are we off of the agenda, off of the administrative? No, we still have, uh, we only did two of them. We have six left. And your choice, you can finish up the administrative or if you want to stay on schedule and, and use the administrative to backfill or do it at the end. So my goal would be to stay on track um, and leave administrative to the end. I would like the commissioners to try and see if we can um, stay tight to adhering to timing on some of these discussions. If they need to be pushed out to future hearings, we can do that as well. Um, Carl, I'm, I'm just going to try and find a different note. So if you can, let's go ahead and open the the okay. 715, but I'm going to work on my other okay. computer to All find. Right. Let, let me let me know when you're back. No, I'm I'm here. I'm just okay. looking on my other computer. So All right. let's go ahead well, and uh, open the 715. 715 continued discussion update. Five Scott Road enforcement order and order of conditions. Mass DEP number. 204-907. Is there anybody here to speak to this project? Yeah, good evening. It's Matt. I'm here. Hey, Matt. You can go ahead. Well, at the uh, last meeting, I had presented you guys with a uh, um, an as-built plan. And, uh, you ha of course, I, I wasn't able to get it until the night of the meeting. Um, and you guys wanted to have some time to look at it. So I wanted to know if you guys looked at it. Um, the area is starting to grow in, albeit slowly. Um, there are areas last week where I reseeded uh, again, and um, I'm just going to keep adding it and watching it grow in. But I wanted to know if you had any questions or anything on the um, the as-built plan for the uh, elevation work. Amy, do you have any comments on the on the as-built? Uh, no. I, did we did it get distributed? I know I, I was trying to look at it during the meeting, but I don't think I ever saw it after that. I mean, if you guys want more time, I got to come back in two weeks anyway, you know, just to keep updating you. And I have a notice of intent that I filed for a uh, 
septic system and retaining wall on another property. So. Um, okay. Why don't we go ahead and, and do that? And we'll ask them, when was that plan submitted? At the last meeting. On the second. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll come, we'll come back to that. So we appreciate you holding over for that. Okay. No, it's not a problem. I mean, whatever you guys need. <laughs> thanks, Matt. All right, thanks. So thanks, guys. Thanks, Matt. Hey, let's continue on the administrative discussion. Um, yeah. 204-868 Crestview, request to withdraw notice of intent. Anybody, uh, anybody they, speaking? Uh, no, nobody came. They, they did submit a letter both to us as well as DP withdrawing it. And town council just kind of agreed that maybe just an affirmatory vote by the commission accepting the withdrawal um, is the so way to go. I think that would be great. Um, certainly we hope that the abutters or someone can hopefully purchase this land. And Carl, I think you'd send some statements around to that. But um, yeah. if we have a commissioner that wants to just go ahead and acknowledge the withdrawal so we can um, vote on that. That would be great. It was a letter dated November 4th. Anybody Small. want to go? Oh. Yep, go ahead. So I'll make a motion that the commission officially acknowledge the uh, letter dated from November 4th, uh, withdrawing the notice of intent for DEP file number uh, 204-868, Crestview. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Okay, perfect. Okay. All those, and so Carl, if you want to do that, roll. Uh, Carl Melberg, aye. Brian Crowley. Brian Crowley, aye. Kyle Maxfield. Kyle Maxfield, aye. Andrew Samarco. Andrew Samarco, aye. Sarah Seward. Sarah Seward, aye. Okay. So we'll jump back to the agenda, mowings on hold, penalties. Amy, is that something? Um, it, had, it had come up a while ago about whether or not you want to discuss issuing penalties in general. Um, I did talk a little bit with town council about it. I frankly wanted to just get it back on the agenda so we didn't forget about it if we ever get like a slow period. Okay. So, so I think I'd like to just kind of go ahead and table that a little bit. Let's go through to the next uh, meeting dates through April. Um, okay. I appreciate that we've all been able to start at seven. Um, it's a little daunting to keep seeing that these agendas are going late into the, the 10 hours. Um, so I'm not sure at some point with holidays coming up, at some point we may need to readdress the, the schedule to add, add another one in here somewhere. So... Uh, Sarah, remember, remember, we were going to discuss uh, limiting the amount, the time that people can actually present. Yep, I, I think that might be great in lieu of the discussion of penalties right now, if we wanted um, to talk about that with the, with the dates. And I really do feel as though information needs to be submitted to Amy days in advance prior. Um, I think it's very hard to try and keep up to date with data that's submitted on Friday or even as late as today as well. Um, Needs to be happening in all the work. Yeah. Carl, do you have um, thoughts on timing or any of the other commissioners and their experience with other boards? Um, I, I don't. I, I think having not like a set time limit, but a a pretty consistent allotted time per hearing would be helpful just because some go on for an hour, whereas some are 10 minutes and then we have gaps in between. So I don't know if there was some way to allow presenter to present and then have public comment to keep it condensed enough. Cause like you were saying, Sarah, we can always continue something on to the next meeting. And okay. um, these have been going on very late. Okay. Okay, so I think, and if someone does present, we will ask them to be concise and in, in a short, shorter abbreviated time, um, provided that they've submitted all their information for us to review ahead of time as well. Okay. Sarah? Um, yep. Hi, sometimes, Jay. Yeah, sometimes it seems like some of that, our body asks too many questions. 
and it's hard to cut it off. It's really hard to cut it off sometimes. Right. You really get into some discussions. It's kind of like. Right. So, and I think that's a good point. And I think that's where collectively the commissioners can help the chair and vice chair to be like, okay, you know, tactfully, let's stay on track. So um, I, I think that we can, in looking at the, the outlines for the next couple of meetings, I, I think there's some that are just going to take a long time. And I agree, Jim. Amy, let's go ahead to the dates. That was as much an FYI in case it, it amazingly worked out. There's a picture of you on that. I forget now. Okay. If, second and if, fourth. if you want to go ahead and can you, can you mute them? Um, so, Amy, if you can um, no, just no. send us a calendar, that would be great. So that way we can look at that. Okay. So let's go ahead to Lake Manawaki Boat Ramp um, as part of the discussion items. Um, that was just a, a quick reminder that those people that are on the hearings, if they can go ahead and mute themselves, that would be appreciated. Okay, go ahead, Amy. Uh, the Lake Manawaki was also sort of a heads up. Um, while the lake is low for draw down, drawdowns, Chuck Bush wanted to do some repairs over at the boat ramp. Um, frankly, I wasn't entirely sure what he was describing to me. So I don't know if some people want to go over there once he has a little better idea. I, I told him that it was not a straight out no if they need to fix the ramp, which is what he was kind of looking for first. Then he's going to go back to the drawing board and and the Lake Matawanagi folks, Matt, um, to see where they want to go and, and get an idea of what wants to be done. So I don't know if anybody wanted to join me on a site walk uh, with Chuck at some point to discuss his options and what they want to do. I think the timing is of the essence that with the water so low that if we're going to do it, it's and if there are needs repair, it would be great to go forward with that. Um, has he submitted any Chucky giving you any photos or anything? He, he sent some photos which were taken by his kayak. They're, they're not great. I'm not going to bother putting them up. Um, okay. I think going out and standing out there yep. is probably going to help. So let, let me see if he can get his a couple options of what they might want to do okay. and see if I can pull some people together. Yep. I think that would be great. Just go ahead if you can nail down a, a date or a time or at least give the commissioners a guidance so that they can just do a drive-by, get out, look at it while the water's low. Yep. Okay. That would be great. Um, it is 728. Let's go ahead. Um, we'll come back to if there's any other administrative items. Let's go ahead and start with uh, discussion for Cooper Farms, lot 12 and lot 13, uh, DEP 204, 845, and 846. Anyone here to present or to discuss Cooper Farm lots? Good evening, Sarah, Jennifer Platt here from Anderson Krieger on behalf of m, &M Realty Trust. And Matthew Field is here as well. And if you'd like, I'm, I'm happy just to jump in. Um, as you may recall, this is the Cooper Farm development. We originally received orders of conditions to build on a um, number of lots, but including lots 12 and lots 13, which as you come into the development down Cooper Farm Lane, there are two lots on the inside of the curve, sort of on the inside of the development next to the open space. And the original plan had been to build a single family house on each lot. Uh, we've, we had process revised our plan so that only one of those two houses was going to be built and has, has been built. Um, we were able to essentially reduce the, the impact by, uh, by half and have the whole second lot, um, lot 12, just be yard, be undisturbed. And if you go way back, what we were originally doing, we had our, our sewer connections were part of the common sewer system was part of the original overall order of conditions. And that had been done uh, se you know, several years ago and approved. Uh, the houses, the only thing that was actually going to be in the 50 foot non-disturb was the, um, the decks. And we were able, since there's only one house now, and we were able to get some approvals from the planning board to move that house 
forward to the street to take it completely out of the non-disturb area. Uh, the outside of the deck is about 58 feet from, uh, the, from the wetland area. So we have been able to decrease impact by taking out one house entirely and then moving the existing house back in the lot or forward in the lot, I should say, to the, the street. Uh, we did file revised plans with the town. We did obtain a building permit, uh, which was signed off by all the departments, including this one. And uh, we have proceeded to build the house. Um, I haven't, we're here, I guess, because there was some concern uh, over there being a change to the plan, um, which again, if anything was a, um, simply not building one of the lots, which was permitted and moving one of the houses further away from the wetland area. Uh, we had believed that by filing the, the new plans with the town and obtaining the building permit and then proceeding uh, apace that that was all we needed, but we're happy to be here and have any discussion you'd like. Okay. Who would like to go ahead and start the discussion? There's a little bit of a, a back um, just story here um, in terms of what the commissioners felt was, uh, I believe, discussed a, a long, long time ago. So Amy, I'm not sure if you wanna um, have discussion. I, I know um, that the plans were submitted. They're on the, the website as well in terms of the building and the reduction of space as well, which is on um, the website. Um, yeah, so back in uh, February 5th, 2018, there was an over an hour discussion um, kind of uh, centered on lot five, which had been built closer um, without approval and what the commission was gonna do about that. And as part of that discussion, the fields, and I can queue it up if you want to, um, had said that they would not be building on lots 11 and, or 12 and 13. Um, There's a long discussion about whether they'd be merged or who would hold them, um, but they ended up dictating a statement that they would never build on those two lots. Um, when the uh, building department came, uh, application came in front of me maybe a year ago, um, I didn't think twice about it. I, I assumed it was one of the uh, lots over on Dean, which they've been working on. So I did sign off on it. Um, when uh, Kyle uh, Mann came and wanted to make sure everything was was straight because um, he was you know, buying that lot to do, <clears throat> excuse me, the building, I realized that uh, there was an issue. So I told him that it was going to have to get straightened out. Um, and the next thing I know, I guess apparently he uh, did not buy it and um, it was being otherwise. Uh, so so that's, that's basically where we are. Um, they do have the plans for basically an as-built for what is there now um, and uh, analysis of what two houses there would have been versus one house in terms of impervious. Um, okay. Well, so what would I'll the commissioner, right yep. thank you, Amy. That was, um, thank you for that um, history. What would the commissioners like? Would you like to hear the audio? Would you like to see um, the as-built um, Jennifer, do you, or would you like to screen share so that you can show the commissioners the plan um, simultaneously if the commissioners would like to hear the audio? Uh, for many of us, we were at that meeting. So. And I am happy to do that. I need to um, sign in again uh, through another, through a bonus computer to share the, the plan, but I can do that if that's helpful. So let me, Okay. Let Amy, so why, why, so why don't we do this twofold just to keep it rolling? Amy, why don't you go ahead and um, do the audio if you are able? All right. And just so you... or Amy, do you, do you have access easily there to the, um, to the as built? It might be quicker if you can share that. Yeah. Can you see my uh, screen now? Yes, I can. It has a. Game All right. Of so obviously you can only do one thing at a time. So the meeting again was an hour long. So this is kind of towards the end of it. Um, and you can also see Keith Bergman and Chuck DaCosta were there as well. So I'm not sure where this is queued up, but. Chuck's just finishing off a little bit of a discussion. Thank you. So does the commission, any members want to make any motions? Or do we want to have clarity of what's being proposed first? I think we need to leave that alone until just do five. 
That's, we're, all, we're only okay. talking about five, but you can talk about the negotiation of five and the offer if it is on the table. The offer is on the table. Right, so do we you want to just spell to, it out? You want to yeah. spell it out to Amy so for she five. can write we're it down willing, for five. We're willing to. Right. Sure. We're willing to. I'm happy. Put in the house. Land of low value. Uh, or the association. Either or the association. Oh, I'm still back on land. Okay. <laughs> or, let, or let Chuck take the notes for you. It's going to be recorded anyway. So you can. Right. Land of low value. Non buildable. Non buildable. That's the way they're recorded. Yes, that's that's right. yeah. Minimal value, non buildable build, and ownership of field development. Or, 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 um, that's what that nice discussion ended up with. Um, I need to go back and look at that. What night is that? Because I know you said I'm not getting anything. Right. So you have to go back and find it. Okay. Okay. So let let's go in. Let's go ahead and and carry on. Um, Comments? Matt, Jennifer? So I, um, there's never been an excess of 23 lots or 23 houses, which are single family houses. Um, it sounds like there may have been a switch at some point between um, 12 and 13 being the non builds with another lot. Um, 12 and 13, as you know, did receive orders of conditions to build. Matt, can you confirm which lot is, well, actually I have it here. I can tell you the non-build. So lots 20 will have not, is a non-build lot. That is correct. And then 12 and 13 were combined into a, a single lot as opposed to having two homes. That is correct. And let's see, 20. Sarah, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's been issues on Zoom tonight, I think, Matt. I'm sorry? <laughs> I think issues. Out. Yeah, I, I just, I haven't been able to talk before, so now Sheila set it up and I can. Okay. Yeah, no, we can hear you. So, Sarah, if you remember back that lengthy discussion we had, we had you, just as a point of reference, Matt. You're referring to that night. That discussion. I am referring to that oh, night sure. back in January. We that's yeah. it. Yeah. So we have some commissioners that weren't there at that meeting. So we're just okay. trying to make sure everybody knows okay. what meeting we're referring to. All right. So what with the house lots on twelve and thirteen originally, the planning board was trying to implement a setback from the road of 25 feet, which in a cluster zone development, we do not, you do not have to adhere to that. You can see that the house is 16 feet. Um, we went back to the planning board. We got the approval. We merged the lots. And also during all of this discussion, we found out that we're only allowed one septic system in 10,000 gallons which reduced the number of lots from 25 to 23 and 16, 55 and overs, which we went back in front of the town and had all of that changed and approved. So if it was thought at that point that those two were non-buildable lots because of the setback, um, we were able to get permission from the planning board to move the houses closer to the street so they would not be um, pushed towards the wetland area. 
Um, but we did reduce the total number of building lots in the development by both combining 12 and 13. And there is a, as I said, lot 20 is reserved. It is not built upon. If there were a change in septic uh, requirements that could, you know, that could become a buildable lot, but it is, it's in all of our documents, all of our master deed and all, it's all um, distinctly notified as um, not buildable. Amy, I also think it's helpful to go back to the, if you go back a, a slide to where it shows the 12 and 13, what would have been built and what was built in terms of statistics. So the top two lot thir 12 and 13 show what, what was originally approved, but then um, said it was not gonna be built. And then this as built shows what ended up. So it wasn't, the amount of impervious wasn't quite cut in half, but, but pretty close. And as they said, they pulled it a little further away from the wetlands. Actually, it's more than half. More than half, I'm sorry, I was just looking at the house, yeah. So one, one thing I noticed with this letter is that all of the drainage is now going to the back and that it wasn't possible to have like half the drainage go towards the front and half of it towards the back. And um, part of the conversation that we had back in 2018 was just surrounding how, you know, this lot is on you know, it was on a hill, the drainage wasn't favorable, they didn't really want to build it anyways, and it would be more environmentally friendly. And it was, you know, kind of the carrot that was held out to us in exchange for, you know, moving the lot five house 11 feet closer to the wetlands and having a buyer um, basically needing occupancy, you know, th this was the offer. Um, so those are, these are just some of the things that I'm noticing, um, you know, had we talked about, had this, this structure been brought before us for discussion, we would have had, um, you know, more conversation about the stormwater. Um, I did drive by and it's completely surrounded by grass. There are no, there's no, you know, trees or vegetation anymore um, in this location. Um, so I just wanted to share those observations. Julie, there was no trees or vegetation there prior either, even when it was a, a field. Okay, so maybe I'm thinking of another lot. There were yeah, this there was, was vegetation. All open this was all open. I thought there was some vegetation between the two. None. Okay. So the storm water, though, we have 100% of the storm water draining towards the wetlands at this point. And you would have that with no house there as well. Well, right, but we wouldn't have lawn or driveway or... There was lawn that we had this loomed and seeded, if Amy remembers. Yep, I said. To stabilize. Well, the, the agreement from 2018 was that those two lots would basically be meadow, which has different runoff characteristics. And berries. Well, we are where we are. Well, with that said, what would the commissioners like to do? Because I think there has to be more discussion here of um, thoughts on what everybody else would like to do. Um, I would just uh, like to know, you said lot 20 is open and, and did you say that it um, in the original plan that it was planned to be built. So this is an additional lot that's open now. That's You're correct. Yes. Kind of offering that as an exchange for, for 13, I'm sorry, 12. So the, it went from 25 approved single family lots or homes down to 23. Um, so two of the lots, 12 and 13, are now combined as a single lot with just one house and then 20 is not being built on. So that is 
as you said, that is an additional open space. So yeah. where is 20, 20, not, 20 is not in the buffer zone and is over by basins three and four? Correct. I don't have the map with me. Toward the end of the cul-de-sac. And who would have ownership of 20? Owners Association. Okay. So that it still will be held by the developer. They can either you know, deed it to the association or retain ownership that's a um, you know, reserved so if, right. So if that's being, so that would have to be deed restricted that nothing would be built on it. They can still hold it, but if that it is, is it is deed restricted at this point. Okay. Was that through the planning board process? And I guess I, um, in addition to that, I could use some clarity on like you, you're referring to 25 lots to 23. That was a, that was a planning board thing. No, that's actually, Julie, that's actually set by DEP. Um, oh, no, no, in order to do the aseptic system, the amount of gallons that can well, go to it. Okay. okay. So that's a board of health type. Yeah. So that's a board of health requirement. Correct. Um, and it is, when I say it's a deed restriction, it's both on the, on the condominium plans and the development plans. You'll see that lot is, is noted as reserved and in all the um, homeowner association documents. So all the recorded documents for the development, it's listed as reserved and not buildable. It's buildable lots are limited to 23. But you then, did you say, say that, um, that if the septic regulations change, that that they can actually build on it in the future. That that to well, me. Speaks if to if it. if laws change, if our setback, you know, for any lot that's not developed in town, if the laws, either the zoning laws, zoning regulations, or wetland regulations, if any of those things change, then development in the future could change. Just as um, as we were starting this project, the non-disturbed area was increased to 20 to 50 feet and we complied with that so it it's not saying that there is any development but i just wanted to be clear that this lot is not it hasn't been um given to the town it's still held by the owner or by the developer so they whatever reserved rights they would have those um you know as as all of the uh septic laws or regulations are written now, there's no ability to, to build on that. Sorry, but you said that it was deed restricted. So yes, is that so the MEF, the Homeowners Association, um, would list that lot as reserved. So, it, and lists the total number of lots that can be built totaled at 23, which, um, and that is, so lot 20 is listed as, is not one of the buildable lots. But that wouldn't be what we would call a deed restriction. Well, it hasn't been granted to a third party, if that's what you're thinking in terms of a deed, a deed that has a restriction on it. It's still held by the developer. There is a, um, a restriction on record in the homeowners association, which is essentially like the condominium documents, a master deed, which is, is a deed restriction on this property. It's, it encompasses the whole development. It says which lots are buildable and which are not. Uh, so so why, why wouldn't that lot just be moved over to the homeowners association? I don't, I don't quite understand it. <laughs> I'm confused. I'm confused by some of the discussion. Whereas the, if the, some hearing things like the rules change, you know, then. Sir, the, you want that lot? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's not, we're, we're willing to take all, any and all of your lots, Matt, but we thought we had this deal before, like with 12 and 13. So I think some no, of us. Planning, no, all right, then, I, then I'll take that back. No, we'll, so I think we'll keep moving forward. Wait, so what my question was, at some point, if, if 12 and 13 were a low value lot, like if we ended our discussion where the audio tape ended and we then thought, okay, that's a done deal. It's not going to be built on. At what point did we lose communication or understanding that things changed? 
So we're always trying to make sure that we're having better communication with, you know, planning board, board of health. So I guess we're just feeling, or I particularly am feeling like we were left out of that loop. And a lot of it is put onto Amy with the, with the developments. Yeah. So never, never was that the intention, Sarah, to leave you out of the loop. We actually thought we did all of it with going to the planning board, merging the lot, um, coming back, applying for a building permit. We never did anything that, in our opinion, that wasn't right. Okay. I mean, this was just brought to my attention by Amy, what, a month ago, Amy? No, I think it was longer ago than that, but yeah. Well, whatever. It was a month ago, a month and a half ago. Okay. So it, 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 we, we, as developers, had 25, we have notice of intents on the lots that were adjacent to that, on all, all the building being done up in Cooper. Um, we, we applied for a building permit. We were granted a building permit. We built the house. We're closing in 10 days. Um, I, I think we did everything that was required. Okay. I, can I throw something in? I think maybe you should have come in for a modified uh, plan where it changed. That's the only thing I think would probably have been the correct thing to have done, Matt. Okay. Right. And as um, a point of order, you guys were on the agenda previously and did not show. Uh, so actually, Sarah, I, I have to, I have to, uh, Apologize for that. I actually had the computer on my lap and I fell asleep. I think I think it was it was that late. I, it, it was it was late. So, um, but I just have one question in terms of the lots twelve and thirteen. Did the town, from an assessor's standpoint, ever declare them as non-buildable, low value? No, I have no idea. No, I don't no. think so. No, nope. that that was the agreement. Okay, I was just curious if the town ever got that memo. So. No, I. I, got, I don't see Sarah. Yep. You want lot twenty right now? Commissioners, what would you like to do? So it's not offered. Let's to make this go know. away and go to bed. So, that, but that's how this situation happened. So I'm a little. I, I'm forgive me for being a little um, concerned about this process because I, I'm hearing a lot of legal lingo that, you know, some of which I understand, some of which I'm, I'm not an attorney and, you know, um, the word deed restriction I'm hearing doesn't mean what we perhaps think it means. And so that's a problem. Um, I would like to know how do we not get in the same place a year from now where you think you did what you were supposed to do, didn't feel you had to come back to talk to us about a specific agreement that was made in light of, a we, you were under a lot of pressure, as you may recall, to get lot five. There was a, you know, a woman ready to move in. She had issues with, you know, she, I forget what it was, but it was an urgent situation and she needed to get in and, you know, this was the what you negotiated with us, and I, I'm just, I'm having a really, hard I time. The house, the house itself was out of the 50 foot buffer on lot five. The Why only you thing that in, the, nevertheless, the house moved 11 feet. No, no, the, the, the deck did. The deck did. That's it. The deck. Not okay. the house. Oh, okay. The house is out of the fifty foot buffer. Okay, so I, I, okay, so we're kind of so only, only sometimes so houses like, that excuse are me. people. Okay, so how do we not get back here? Yep. As a, as a point of order, if one person can speak, we'll restrict lot twenty. Michael, stop to the to town or association okay. as unbuildable. Now, if we want to carry on with this conversation, you will now address the chairman. So, if we're going to carry on a discussion. One person will speak at a time. And I'll, I'll handle it, Sarah, and I'll direct my question to you. You can go to James. James is the chairman this evening. He's on now. Good, so, you want a good job, Sarah. Why don't you finish this job? <laughs> Great. Okay. <laughs> so as a point of order, we have to be clear of what we're discussing this evening. Um, this is not horse trading. And so if we reiterate what our discussion is tonight of 12 to 13, we still have concerns about drainage as well. So if we want to have a mirror discussion of the offering of 20, 
If the commissioners, if that appeals to them, we can do that as well, but we still have to address perhaps whether it's plantings or really have assurances that the drainage is gonna work on 12 and 13. Um, I would defer to the commissioners to speak and offer discussion. And if they have a question for the developer to address it. Um, Sarah, uh, I was wondering, is the yellow yellowed block, is that 20? Is that lot 20? Is that the proposed uh, gift? No, that, that was just how I got 20 is down at the end. There you go. That's the that's the one. Okay. It's it's not even in the buffer zone, I don't believe. So you don't have jurisdiction over it anyway. But it it may abut. Does it abut conservation land or the 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 restricted land? So Matt, can you take a second and discuss the value of lot twenty? The value is a lot because it it's part of. It's part of the walking trail going out to the backfield as well as going through. If you look at the walking trail goes along the back side of lot 20, along the back of 19, 18, 17, out to that field down below, as well as following her cursor going up and around. It is a, it's a very good lot. I, I just. Out of curiosity, Matt. Mm -hmm. Would that entertain a small parking area or something if people were used, wanted to walk from there? I don't, I don't think we'd have any prayer of getting that approved through the Homeowners Association. Okay. But it seems so, like it does have value if you've got your trails going through it. Yeah, but the people that are buying these homes not going to allow that. The association won't. We're, we've we've just got the road approved through the town. Um, well, again, we had the ball field out in the front, and, and there was no parking in the neighborhood for the ball field as well. Matt, is are there any um, is there anything on that lot now in terms of? anything running through it like uh electricity oh, yeah. it's, it's the same as all the other ones we have the sewer in the back of it uh we have an easement we have electrical it's the same as all of them have the sewer running down through there but there's nothing that would be maintained by the t in nothing that would need to be maintained by the town if we were to take over this lot michael can you answer the questions is this, is the tank there for the no, no, but th there is the sewer easement that goes across the back side of lot 20. So if anything, it would either be land at low value or be uh, turned over to the association as a unbuildable um, lot. Unbuildable lot. Unbuildable lot. Association. Um, I want them to take over the taxes anyway. So I think that's so, a good idea. So the association could take over that as open space and be used as a access out to those two areas that Matt already talked about. Um, I was wondering, could that be used as a community garden? Yeah, I mean, it can. There's there's already two other spots in the association, association that they have for community gardens. Um, one right to the Dean Lane and the lower sections where we reduced uh, the six lots that we had in the uh, cul-de-sac down to four. And um, there's a parcel up towards uh, the east side of the association where um, the association um, could use um, out in the front as a community garden as well. So, I mean, it's just, it's more of a walking path in access to the, um, there's graded base already out there that goes, mm -hmm. it's used for uh, getting out behind out Tra to that field for the tractor path that goes out um, to that lower field to be uh, aid. So. Okay. Okay, commissioners, um, what, what are your thoughts? So oh. we have a discussion of 12 and 13 and an offer of 20. So do we, let's finish up with the discussion of lots 12 and 13. And, and if I may, sir, I'd also say for 12 and 13, you need to decide whether it knows, knows intent, amend and order conditions or a field change. So, so Sarah, I don't think with Julie's, I don't think Julie's question was ever answered when she, Posed her in, regard, question. in regards to drainage. 
Is that what you're referring to, Carl? Well, no, it's more of a question as to how how this whole thing came about. I think she was just trying to get to the core because she was because I think she was concerned just about you know future actions that might come our way, and she just wanted she wanted well, to make future sure, actions, Carl. She wanted to make sure. I'm going to let Julie phrase her question again, but I just want to make sure that she gets her question answered. That's all. Well, if, if I might, for, for the chair, um, I, I agree. I think communication is very helpful. Um, and even for something which might be a minor modification or a minor field change, having those communications are, are helpful. Oh. And I think we, you know, we're here because we thought everything was clear we thought there was enough information but clearly there there was a gap and we want to make sure that we can help provide that information going forward so if if that's i think what we're looking for is to have more of a an open dialogue or to make sure that um you know i i guess we would take take suggestions on on going forward which here i mean i think this was from my perspective, a very exciting change to be able to reduce impact um, and reduce the, the number of houses and take it out of wetlands. So you know, we'd, we'd love to get the sort of favorable feedback on that, uh, but also have make sure that there's that continuing dialogue going forward. But for the major record of things, it seems like it should be have a a filing of a modification just sort everything because you move, move two lots together. Well, that wouldn't, I and, don't think the merging of the lot has any, um, any impact. We simply didn't build one of the two houses that had been permitted. Um, I think a, maybe, uh, maybe a minor modification would be appropriate just to, um, to clarify that for the file. Yes, I think that would be reasonable. Amy, is that reasonable in your mind? It's, it's up to you guys. Yeah, you know, I think we also have to have assurances of the drainage. And so if there's anything that needs to be changed out there for drainage or for plantings as well, just because it never came in front of us. Actually, it did come in front of you, Sarah. Your, your, your agent signed off on it. And, and, and that, that, frankly, was a mistake because the agreement had been it was not be built. Now, right. I, I also right. the commission know that... Um, I do have a hold on the um, occupancy permit of this while this gets uh, straightened out because I hadn't been getting any responses. It's been a lot longer than a month. Uh, right. and so, it, it, this has been on conversation for more than a month. So, yeah. um, and, and, and that's the thing. We, don't, we, we can't have this thrown back at Amy because she happened to sign that. I mean, it's that's, that's, well, kind of, that, that's, that's your professional, that's the, Carl. That's the kind of stuff that we don't, that were very concerned about happening. She said it was a mistake. She said we built a house. She it's admitted all built, that. ready to close. Yeah, and and the, the building code says that the building official is authorized to suspend or revoke a permit issued under the revisions of the building code, where <laughs> permit is issued in error or on the basis of incorrect, inaccurate, or incomplete information. So if Just we can, chair, please. No, so hold, this, hold no, on. No, yes. Excuse I like this. Excuse me. So as, as we discuss, we're going to carry on the conversation with the commissioners to see if they have questions first on 12 and 13. So we have questions of drainage. We have question of protocol here. But let's carry on the discussion to see what questions we have. And then we will ask you all to see if we can make amendments to that. So what I'm hearing so far is that we're talking about drainage. What else would we like to have from the commissioners? Um, I would I would suggest um, so that we can have assurances that twenty, you know, they would move forward with twenty as they uh, as they offered today. That um, that before we you know close on this, that we have we have that agreement, the homeowners association wording and agreement in hand. Um, be my suggestion. Julie, let's go back to the original question of drainage. Uh, do you have any concerns or would you seek a modification or anything changed looking at the as-built? 
I mean, it, it is a smaller impervious area. I think the problem is, you know, in the discussion in 2018, we discussed if it was coming back, it would be a new filing, um, which didn't happen. And now we've got a, a surprise house that we now need to retro retroactively um, look at. Um, so, you know, I know we have the impervious areas. You know, where does the drainage just go onto the grass? I mean, there's a there's a pretty steep hill there, so I'm wondering if there will be gullying or erosion. Um, I'm also curious about, you know, so I know Matt said vegetation wasn't cleared, but it still wasn't manicured lawn. And so I'm also, I'd be interested in seeing just how close the lawn is to the wetland line since these lots were offered. Um, and, you know, in the notes saying they were, um, you know, less desirable because of the slope and because of the erosion and the, you know, higher potential, um, you know, for issues that the site had, you know, quite a bit of when, you know, I'm sure nobody forgot the, the buckets and the rakes and the wetlands. Um, so I, I feel as though a site walk is in order, um, you know, to just kind of look at those things and to perhaps pull some of the lawn back. Um, it looked to me like it was a, it, it was pretty close, but it, it was 445, so it was getting dark. So I really can't say for sure. Um, and I, you know, I, Matt, when you say you didn't clear trees, I believe you. Um, okay. But I don't think I, I, you know, we had talked about an amended order or a new filing for these lots back in 2018. Um, so to do a field change or, you know, some sort of limited action, I, I don't feel is appropriate, especially given the situation. And I like the doc, you know, the documentation I think is, is another necessary step. Um, also, Sarah, didn't you, weren't there on other parts, other properties, uh, signage uh, as to where that 50 foot no disturb is so that the homeowners, you know, recognize they're not supposed to pile leaves there or do anything like that. Um, right didn't there. we have the design little signs? Or am I thinking of another one? Can you see that on the screen? They're all posted. It was the uh, CC points, I believe. So is that sign right off their deck? Because I, I noticed in the other drawing, the deck is, what was it, 51.2 feet off of the wetland line? So is the, the sign like right at the bottom of, of their deck? Matt, Matt or Michael, do you have it's at, the, it's at the no disturbs area, which it is, is within 12 or 13 feet of the existing tree line and that was there prior to doing anything. Uh, also, there is a um, sewer main that goes behind the house within five feet of the tree line as well that's already there that has to be maintained and is in a grass area already. So between the house and the woods, there's already a order conditions for a existing sewer main that goes there. Um, that's, that was there prior to even doing a house, prior to having the house moved from the buffer zone that, that you couldn't build on prior to doing anything. So now that we moved it out of the buffer zone, the house and the deck are out of the buffer zone right now. They meet town requirements right now. Any other commissioners have any comments? When you say it's out of the buffer zone, you mean out of the 50, right? Out of the 50 foot buffer zone, yes. There's a sewer main that's within somewhere between 38 or 39 feet from the edge of wetlands, already there behind the house that has already had a pre existing order of conditions for it, the whole subdivision prior to doing it. You can it. see it right there, the sewer force main right there. The Curses on it. Okay. So just to recap on the signage, so does the sign need to move the signage? There's a sign down towards the lower side that has right down by the um right there, um, yeah. Cut, um, yes, the uh, yep, right there. There's one already there. And then right over here on this side, there's one right there. Okay. 
Okay. Um, there's a fallen tree right there on the other side where a uh, lot uh, 12. 12 was. There's a tree right there that has to, you know, there's a sign. The, the tree line's right there still. Um, it's okay. mostly uh, multi-floral roads right there. Um, All right, so we're, we're over 30 minutes past the allotted time for this, so we need to come to some conclusions or um, carry on with this. So what would the commission like to do? Numbers? Uh, I think I agree with Julie that I think we need to do a site visit. Okay. Amy, when is the, the date of the next meeting? December? December 2nd sounds familiar. November 30th, actually. Okay. We get three this month. November 30th. So I think what we're hearing is that the commissioners would like to schedule a site visit. Is that a meeting on the 30th? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. okay. Would you want a modified plan? Well, we have the as built. Yeah, but you've combined two lots now into one. So that should be corrected. Right. That, that's what this shows. Okay. Yep. You're probably just having the, uh, the sewer force meet on here, wherever it is. So what we will try and do in order to stay on is at the end of this meeting, we'll try and come up with a time that will work for the commissioners to go out um, or if it's um, the developer owner can also allow commissioners to go at their uh, oh, leisure. It's it's all grassed. It's it's done. Okay, I think that might might be best. So um, if you would like, we can continue this to November thirtieth with your permission. Jennifer, we agree. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to go back. Sorry, we're a little late. We're going to open the eight o'clock public shut this off. notice of intent 107 Mattawanaki, um does not mm -hmm. have a UP number 47-19. Uh, uh, construction yeah. of a single family home and septic system. Do we have anyone here to speak to that? I thought I saw Ted in here. Oh yeah, he's Ted's here. Um, Ted, are you here? If you are, you're Muted yeah, 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 yeah. I'm here. I'm on two meetings tonight, so I got you on my backup here. So, um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Did you open the hearing? We are open now. Do you have something that you would like to present in terms of plans and discussion? Uh, no, not this time. Um, we have. Um, we're going to go through. We want to go through Board of Health, so we want to continue to a, a date such that we have our um, Board of Health uh, approval. Um, I don't think we'd have that before February. Okay. So we, before February. Yeah. Which is, you know, they, he's got to negotiate with the homeowner and then we got to get it to Jim. Jim's backed up uh, a couple months. So I'd rather just go out once rather than, you know, come back every two weeks or something. Um, okay. And just continue so, to take up time. So we will go ahead and table this until we have a formal filing, but please note that if there's snow cover, um, the commissioners will not be able to go out on site for observation. Amy, is um, that okay? Yeah, uh, if, you'd like, if you'd like to schedule now. No, nope, we're not oh, going to because yeah. it's, you, we don't have anything in front of us. Yeah. There are a cutter, couple of abutters, or at least one abutter um, here. Um, do you yeah, know that's us. That we're not going to hear basically hear it tonight. We'll wait until they go get their Board of Health permit. And that's fine. I just wanted to make sure that... Um, everyone knows too that we we aren't getting the notice of intent or we haven't been getting any correspondence about this so far we talked to the assessor's office but they're behind on having us listed as a property owner so okay mm -hmm. so off offline what we would suggest is you um in touch with mr Doucette, who's on right now who can take your your data as as well so that way you can make sure that what's you're the, what's the address which address it's 105 Mattawanaki. Okay. Okay. All right. I believe, yeah, I believe the owner's been in touch with you, though, right? No. Okay. So if you guys can just kind of. Um, well, so we are the owners, but the previous owner also has not been in touch with us. Right. You're the owner of 105. Yes. All right. You. There was a certified mail sent to you. So it was not sent to us, it was sent to the previous owners. 
That's true. I went, yeah, I went, it, we have to notify uh, who's on the assessor's list. We get that. So um, did you get the notice though? Did you receive it or did you deny it or? We never received it. It was never offered to us. We talked to okay. the assessor's office, but they're behind on listing us as the property owners, even though we closed on the property in early September. Okay, Sarah, sorry, just to just take a second. Then if it's not in the, it's, if it's not in the assessor's um, office, can you just give me your name? Yeah, Chris Krobak. C-H-R-O-B-A-K. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, okay. Thank you for bringing that to um, his attention. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Thank you. All right. Okay. So we're going to go ahead on to public hearing for 815 notice of intent 38 Harwood U41-8 uh, no DEP number raising existing dwelling and construction of new dwelling and sewage disposal system. Is there someone that would like to speak to 38 Har Harwood? Yes, this is Brandon Ducharme with Dave D. Ross. Welcome. Thank you. Um, do you guys have the ability to put the plan up or? Amy, can you screen share with him? Me. Give him, sorry. Give him the opportunity to screen. Do you have it, David, or do you need me to put it up? If you could put it up, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Mm. So as I said, Brandon Ducharme with David E. Ross here on behalf of the applicant, Rich Watson, Watson Homes. Um, we filed a notice of intent <clears throat> for 38 Harwood, which is just being shown on the plan. Um, the project consists of demolition of an existing single family home, reconstruction of a new one. Um, part of this is the, the current septic system was in failure. So we're also as part of this is it's upgrading um, the septic system, also increasing the flow, the new bed, the uh, New house would be a four bedroom, single family house. Um, it's about a half acre lot on the north side of Harwood. And as you can tell on the plan, there's, there's two wetland resource areas that kind of impact um, the property. There is a brook in the back. Um, you can kind of see towards the back of the, pl the plan there where the topo lines kind of get tight together. Uh, the lot's generally pretty flat. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, gently slopes toward the back and then it drops off steeply to a, to a larger wetland system in the back there. Um, there is a bordering vegetated wetland uh, that extends, has a hundred foot buffer zone that extends into the property. You can also see the 50 foot wetland offset. There's also the brook back there is considered a perennial stream, which has a corresponding 200 foot riverfront area, which comes up kind of right through the middle of the proposed septic system. Um, there's also on the other side of Harwood Ave, uh, Beaver Brook kind of runs behind the houses on that side. It's, it's off view of the plan, but that 200 foot river front to Beaver Brook extends into the front, just, just kind of along the front of the proposed house. And Essentially, as I said, mo most of this project is really just reproducing um, what's already on the site, just obviously with uh, new reconstruction, new construction. Um, the existing house, you can see the, the dashed footprint um, kind of in the same, same location of where the proposed house is. There's an existing driveway that comes in off of Harwood which essentially the only difference is we're kind of just regrading to level out the new driveway and we're showing a proposed turnout there as you kind of come into the left. And that's just so, you know, just to give the opportunity for any vehicles pulling out of the garage to be able to, to turn around and face forward before entering onto Harwood. Um, in the back, we've got a 20 foot by 30 foot uh, on-site sewage disposal system which is essentially in place of where the existing system is. Um, I would say probably three quarters of that proposed leaching bed is within the 200 foot riverfront area. Um, it's important to note all the work proposed is essentially in the riverfront. Uh, we're outside of the 100 foot buffer zone. Um, the only alternative to get that 
replacement septic further outside of the riverfront would be to build in place of where the reserve area is, which is that dash box, same footprint that's to the left of where we're proposing it. And really the only reason is um, that we're showing it in place where it is, even though it is on paper within the riverfront area, the site is, is essentially all you know, well-drained gravel. So the proposed system is gonna be, you know, when all said and done, the existing lawn is gonna be restored to the same elevation that it was. If we were to build in the location of the reserve area, it would require us to um, cut into the existing wood line, take down some trees. Um, as it stands now, all the work that's being done will essentially take place without having to lose any vegetation on site. Um, with the exception, that there's a few landscape plantings, you know, just in front of the house, you know, within five feet of the, the front of the existing house. Um, in the front as well, the proposed driveway and a very, very small sliver of the proposed house is within the 200 foot riverfront area. Again, there's a resource partition. You've got Harwood Ave in between um, this property and um, where the, the actual stream Beaver, Beaver Brook is. Um, we've, sh we've shown a proposed erosion control barrier in the back of the house that kind of goes along the existing wood line and wraps around the backside of the septic there um, just to basically denote a limit of work and obviously to provide um, a defense against any potential risk of erosion on the site. Um, the proposed house, as is the existing, is gonna be serviced by uh, municipal water. There's an existing water gate in the front of the property. So there's a water line that will just basically just be you know, reconnected into the proposed house. Um, we've gone ahead and we've shown a proposed stockpile area for any site material, building products, anything like that. And we've, we've been able to locate that outside of any wetland resource area outside of the riverfront area. Um, so essentially what we've done here is we've tried to keep all the proposed features of this project within the same footprint of what's already there, as well as providing, you know, mitigation in the form of erosion control. So at this point, I'm sure the commission might have some questions. Um, happy to answer whatever you may have. Commissioners have any questions? So did you say that the system is in failure? I believe it, I believe it is, yes. I, I don't know if it, if it actually went through a formal Title V, but um, I do know that if it was to have a Title V, it would not pass. So yeah, regardless, the system would need to be upgraded. Commissioners? Shall we schedule a site walk? Yeah, for sure. Um, would we like to have the engineer there? Is it fairly self-explanatory? Um, when were the wetlands flagged? Um, it was in the notice of intent there. Let me just put my fingers on it. But the flags are all visible. Yeah, it was done in October of 2019, so about about a year old. But yeah, they should be out there. I can I can make sure that they're in place. If not, we can we can freshen them up so they're there for a site walk. And I could also be available for that site walk. Um, and to answer your question, everything is pretty self-explanatory. You know, the fact that the existing house is there, um, you know, everything's within the limit of the yard, so we can kind of pace off and figure out where everything is. The driveways in the same location. Is the house are, people, are there people living there now? That is a good question. Um, I do not believe so. Um, but if, if there is, obviously, we can, we can be in touch and let them know that we're going to be out there. Okay. Commissioners, do you want to have a time that we all gather, or would you like to do it individually um, with Brandon and the homeowner's uh, permission? I think it would be helpful for this one to go out in a group with the engineer. Okay. Do you have an idea, Andrew, when you'd like to go? Or 
when, Brandon, do you think you can, you're ready to accommodate commissioners? We're ready whenever you guys are. Yep. Okay. Thoughts, Kyle, Brian, Julie? There's this. <laughs> Um, so I was just, I guess, noticing the, um, well, not just noticing, but the, the 200 riverfront area, um, I'm wondering about that 5% impact, particularly when, excuse me, especially since this is already developed, does that come into play? So in the process of filing this, um, there's a box that we would check on the form three. And I, I went back and forth. I mean, in all facts, you know, it, it is a redevelopment project. Um, typically, if you were to check that box and file it under the redevelopment provisions, um, you'd be looking at, you know, a mountain impervious area. I think with the, this driveway, um, it's about 150 to 200 square feet of additional impervious area, which really isn't that much. And the fact that when we, if we do just file it straight, um, we do comply with this, the stormwater management policy. I mean, not the stormwater, the uh, riverfront policy where I think it's about 3,500 square feet of alterations. So we're less than the, um, the 5,000 square feet. I think, wasn't there a 5%? I thought it was a either or a percentage or a square. I mean, maybe we just need to look, look in, like look into that and button that up. Yeah, the, the state. Close the hearing. 10%. 10%. Okay. It's 10%. Oh, yeah. It's basically the development and a single family home. So. Okay. Thanks, Amy. Yeah. Oh, it just says right there. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to site walk time now or? Yep, let's go ahead while, because this is going to be an on site. When would we like to do it? I know we've got a little bit of a cold spell coming. Um, I can do it tomorrow or next week. Next week, I should be able to do anytime after like one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Fridays are usually the easiest for me. Okay. Fridays are good for me too. All right, do you guys That's want to come? Friday, if anybody cares, isn't it? Not well next week. Well, if you want to do, <laughs> it, this Black week, Friday. do it this week, yeah, I could do it this week. Okay, Brian and Julie. Yep. Andrew, could you do? I can't do Friday, but could you do it? We'd like to try and have at least two commissioners, hopefully three, on site. I could do Friday around like. Or 10 ish this week, if that's not too late. That's starting to get pretty dark, but Is it? it's mm. not terrible at four. We, yeah, it's doable. Yeah, you can probably sneak it in 15 oh. minutes. Out I, there. I could make that works for me. So, Julie, Brian, and Andrew yep. on Friday? Well, yeah, save, save four o'clock, and then Andrew will just run and catch up, maybe. <laughs> Fly back from Lowell, 100 miles an hour. Exactly. <laughs> we'll give you a second tour. Exactly. Okay. All right, maybe great. I'll, so, maybe I'll try and make it too if I can. Yeah. The next, the next hearing would be November 30th. Um, if we want to go ahead and continue that to November 30th, with the site visit scheduled for this Friday at between starting four four ten. You need an in state at this point. I think he, he's going to be there. Do, commissioners, oh. would you like anything staked? I think, I mean, the driveway is going to is going to go in pretty close to the same spot and as well as the house. Um, right. I mean, I guess knowing where the septic tank is would be good to figure that out ahead of time. So we're not, you know, on a scavenger hunt for some, <laughs> some obvious sign. Yeah, yeah I can. I can mark out the septic system. That's really the only thing that's kind of in the middle of the lawn there, just so you have an idea of exactly where that is. Okay, great. Thank you, Brandon. Okay, and double check the wetland flags. Yep. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving right along for eight thirty continued public hearing notice of intent three three six three three eight King Street. 
DEP 204916, Senior Residential Development. Bruce or anybody here for that? Amy, are they coming? Um, as with Ted, Bruce, I think, is got dueling uh, meetings going on. Okay. Is there anyone here uh, in the audience that is addressing King Street? Well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm a representative, but Bruce is really the best person to speak to that. Um, Matthew Blackham is here also. Okay. Yep. Or we, we could also go back to the uh, goals, priorities, and budget, which I didn't print out. Okay, so why don't we keep this open and see if Bruce, unless Matthew or Diane, you have something that you'd like to bring to our attention. But let's just, while we're waiting for Bruce, we're just going to carry on with some administrative um, discussions, okay? That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Amy, um, we ended on the boat ramp. Other updates, any administrative actions that you need for us to do? Um, we do need to, and tonight's probably not the night to discuss a sort of a, a Cloverdale management plan. Okay. Um, uh, but maybe we can, do, we can do that the next time, especially the mowing piece of it. Okay. Did you want to discuss the priorities? Do you have that that you can do a screen share? I know that you did share it with the commissioners um, some time ago. Or yeah, I had a little bit of a panic here. Um, let me try that again. So um, the goals and priorities can wait a little bit, but the budget is more key and, and they kind of go together. Okay, perfect. Um, Let's do that. Let me see if... What I can find here. This isn't looking too good. Yeah, can you see that? I'm not sure. Yeah, if you just, I think it has to, wait one second. Needs to slide a little bit. Yeah, it's, um, I had to just email to myself, like just before the meeting, so I haven't looked at this yet, but it, it actually shows most of it. Um, so, uh, the office supplies and, and the goal for the town is is not to change anything um, because of revenues are down. Uh, so the office supplies don't change. Um, and then it's just a question of what uh, Cloverdale uh, type expenses or Cloverdale, Oak Hill um, funds you might, might want to use. Um, this is pretty much what we've had before last year or this current fiscal year, it was a total of 18,500. Um, for next year, uh, the total was 23, but there's still 8,500 left from this current year. Um, so it would be actually 4,000 in yellow, $14,650 versus the current fiscal year, which is 18,500. Um, I had, the land steward general supplies is, is pretty basic. The open space maintenance, um, that's usually a catch-all for Oak Hill gravel, which we need to discuss. Um, the five swing signs and two kiosks finish off uh, that piece of it, the swing signs and kiosks. The Mary Shepherd survey is new. We're actually, uh, Jim, Rick, and I are going out tomorrow to see if we can find any bounds or some way of sneaking a trail through there to make Mary Shepherd into a loop. Um, so that may or may not end up needing a survey. There, there is at least one encroachment over there. Another, somebody is mowing the field, given the invasives, maybe not the worst thing, but they're using it for their own, their own stuff. Um, we're considering another uh, wildflower meadow next to the one that we just seeded over at Cloverdale. Um, so that's three dollars for that seed. And then the question of whether or not you want to include a mowing allowance, either for Mary Shepherd, which the highway cannot really get to with their equipment because of where it is, or the, um, the Nega parcel over by the orchard, which I think highway can do, but we haven't nailed that down yet. And then lastly, there's a little bit more of Cloverdale survey, which I think would be really handy. So it's clear between the town and the abutters property who owns what. 
What is that comment um, on Cloverdale Pass where it has 1500? I can't read where it says plus and then it's cut off. Plus expenses. Okay. It's, it's not going to be that much. It's not going to be 1750, but I put a little bit of stopgap in there. Okay. So that's not an addition to, that's a total. Okay. Correct. Okay. Right. Anybody have any thoughts or comments on the proposed budget? I was wondering if we could um, put in a little budget for signs regarding um, dog feces. Um, I was noticing, well, one of the things I was noticing today, you know, down Russell Street, folks on the new sidewalk, you know, walk their dogs right near the wetland. And I've definitely observed no bags, but then also, you know, Jim has posted quite a bit about finding um you know, and then also got me to thinking about the current situation with COVID. And, um, you know, I know Amy had to get a bunch of signs out quickly. And so I don't know if, you know, like a nominal budget for some sort of like smaller, um, you know, smaller sign might be useful. Uh, Cindy Napoli had asked for time tonight, but then thought it might be um, jumping the gun a little bit from her side about the, um, the leash law piece of thing. Oh, okay. um, I was in the back of my mind, can open, get a little money from the board of selectmen, the select board, or especially leash law type signs. Um, once we figure out what's going on there. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I think some, if you will, dog waste signs is a good idea. Can but, I throw something in? Yep. I would like to see some right to farm signs at some point. Didn't we used yeah. to have some of them? Huh? Didn't we have some at one point? No. They're on the surrounding towns all around us, but not in on Littleton at I all. Thought those, I thought those signs came with a designation somehow, either through the select board or the Ag Commission or something. And we are it hasn't happened anyway. So it would be kind of nice to see something. Right. Andrew, do you know anything about that? Yeah, the AgCom was actually looking into this and uh, looking at some designs for right to farm community signs, uh, but we haven't met in a couple months uh, due to COVID and other things. So I'm sure we'll be bringing that up pretty soon again. Uh, funding, um, I'm not sure where it would come from, maybe the select board, but it's definitely on the list of priorities for the AgCom. Okay. I mean, there is some agricultural land that the uh, Conservation Commission oversees. So I didn't know whether that would be appropriate for at least coming from somewhere out of our budget or from Oak Hill or something. That's a good point. Yep. Yeah, I'm not sure if Oak Hill could be used for that. Andrew, at some point, could you see, do you know what the other towns have been paying for their signs or you would think there would be a standardized sign? It they, isn't. They're all different. They are all different. Yeah. Each town uh, has their own version of it. Okay. And we could go out and see what companies would charge. But I, was, I was just curious what some of the other towns had paid. So, Okay. All right. uh, Amy, what do you have up on the screen? Uh, that, that, this is just the uh, goals. Okay. So this is a red line basically from last year's. And I haven't really changed it much. Um, I, I will really say that, can slide that the, the planning board has a $12,000 budget for a rapid response protocol except for when a piece of property becomes available. Bruce just got here. Um, all right, so let's, let's come back to this and see. Um, Bruce, if you're here, your hearing has been open. So if I'm here. If you want to jump right in, that's great. Good evening. Um, this uh, week or so ago, um, Liz, Kyle, myself, and uh, Diane got together. Um, Amy, Bruce, Amy. Up, oh, Amy. I'm sorry, Amy. You're in the wrong town. I, I literally, I still have the wrong picture in the background too. Yep. 
no time. <laughs> I literally jumped off the other uh, the other meeting. Uh, we got together. We reviewed the, our commitment letter. Um, I believe that that's been circulated amongst the commissioners, so you've had a chance to review it. We also submitted a um, uh, an exhibit plan showing the area of the conservation restriction, uh, the easement for the community access from the uh, library slash town hall and ball field property across to Castle in the Trees, Castle in the Woods. Um, and it seems to me there's one other thing that we submitted, but I haven't had a chance to bring it all back up on my screen. So uh, I think those were the two things. So I, I, one was a PDF and one was a, uh, a Word document. So there were three items, but the same, the same letter. Um, we went through and wordsmithed uh, an awful lot of it. We removed wet meadow and just called it meadows. We addressed the trail uh, work and the maintenance. We put a detail on the plan to kind of show that uh, the width of the trail would vary between six and 10 feet. And then we would have a, a four to eight foot buffer on either side where it was out in the open. It could be mowed, but that wouldn't mow into wetlands. So if the trail was on the edge of wetlands, uh, the edge of the trail would be uh, where the wetland line is. So we're not looking to destroy any other vegetation. We talked about the planting areas. Um, in the previous hearings, we had talked about the plantings being primarily in the area between the proposed development and the wetland line that's in the, the meadow, which is actually in the short grass in many places and not in the taller, longer grass. Um, one of the things we came up with was putting bounds along that line so there would be no question. Thank you, Amy. Uh, the red dots replicate uh, bounds in those locations and the clouds represent areas where we would do uh, the initial planting once the residents are in and have had some time to kind of feel how and where that those plantings might be. Those plantings in that area would be uh, minimal shrub. Um, I think we've listed 10 or 12, I can't even remember now, uh, shrubs and 50 perennials. Um, I further went and got estimates for the plant materials to be purchased and installed and for our survey crew to purchase and install the bounds. It came up to roughly $4,500. So we'll call it a round number of 5,000. But on behalf of the applicants, we very much wish that there not be a bond put on this. We don't feel that it's necessary. It's in the commitment letter, which is going to be either added onto or referenced in the order conditions. I'm certain it'll be in the order conditions as well. And um, unlike many of the other projects that have been before you over the years and that I've brought before you over the years that have been by developer, um, this, is, this project is being brought to you by some of the end users. So they have everything to lose and nothing to gain by not doing what they say they're going to do in the commitment letter. And I don't see the need for a bond in this particular case. And that's really all I have to say this evening until you have a question for me. I think sometimes with bonds, we, we get concerned. So when, if we're asked to issue partials um, for, you know, financing, things like that. So we're just very uh, cautious to issue um, compliance letters. Well, um, the proposed work on here um, has, for the existing part of the existing unit and three of the proposed buildings, all two of them duplexes and another one single family, um, and then the drainage. So those are all the things that need to happen in the buffer zone in order to um, in order to move the project forward. So if that stuff is done, then a uh, you know there could be a request for a certificate of compliance. Uh, otherwise, you know, there, there's, that's the main stuff right down near the edge that we're doing. The trail maintenance is an ongoing thing and, and pretty minimal. 
and the trail maintenance is in, in the bonds. I mean, we can put the bond, the monumentation in at any time. Um, but the, you know, the planting is, is pretty minimal and it's more a, a practice of, of a commitment letter to let you know that the applicant wishes to do more to protect the wetlands than they do to try to work a way into it or, you know, make it their dumping ground. And that's not the case. It's, it's an, an amenity that they're very happy to have as part of their development. Commissioners, anybody have any questions or comments? Is that uh, where the bounds are? Are they going to have little signage that says it doesn't go beyond that? No, we're not proposing signs. Um, that was the thing we talked about, and we left that as an open end that the commission could have signs uh, if they felt that there was a need for them at some point in the future on either the trails or along the wetland edge. Um, but, uh, you know, this is, this is our bounds that are going to let you know where the wetland line was defined as and plantings that would happen to help enhance what is currently lawn to be back into a wet meadow. Um, it was not a discussion in our little subgroup to um, have signs that say this is the commission. We did talk about it, but there was no strong desire for it. So, you know, we let it go that way. Just that we seem to require that at some of these other projects. That's up to the board, but that's what we've done, I believe, up at Durkee. We've done it uh, over to Recoupa. Okay, can we get some more feedback, other commissioners? Um, we had a good talk. Okay. Kyle, go ahead. Uh, we had a good talk a couple weeks ago. Sorry, your your audio, Carl, isn't working. I mean, Kyle. Now we lost. I'm not sure what's going on with my audio tonight. Anyway, I I agree with everything that Bruce said. We had a really good talk a couple weeks ago um, about what you're seeing on this plan and in the commitment letter. I think we kind of covered every outstanding issue that we had at the previous meeting. I'm going to try to not talk anymore because it's clearly not. <laughs> okay. Brian, any, any thoughts or. Yeah, I, I concur. I think, uh, I think it looks good. Um, as Kyle said, I think, I think most everything that came up in the last meeting has been addressed. So um, in a good spot. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, just as, as Jim had brought up, I just want to make sure that we're consistent where we where we require bonds and where we don't i mean consistency is is key to our decision making so that would be my carl, carl did you say bounds or bonds bond bond okay, okay. i so think if, i think uh, we're doing with the commitment if if at, at some point it was apparent that signage was needed is it spelled out that we know who will be paying for that signage um, it said that the commit, it says that the commission can ask for signs. So I guess that would be that the applicant would have to put signs up. I mean, I, we literally asked, do you want it to put, you know, the post in, do you have signs that you want to put on it? And we had the discussion of putting bounds in the ground that are not going to be able to be removed without a lot of effort and a bunch of digging to um, delineate where the line is. And unlike um, the subdivisions that you mentioned, where there are developers putting in the buildings and they're, you're marking the line and you're letting people know where you can, uh, where not to throw uh, yard waste in this, et cetera. Um, you know, we have at least one of the future residents online with us now and others that are, are watching and they're informed of this whole process as we've been going. Um, I don't foresee there to be an issue here. Okay. A Amy, what are your thoughts procedurally? Um, 
I, what was I going to say? So the commitment letter did say that those plans and bounds have to be put in before a certificate of compliance will be issued. So that, that is in the commitment letter. Okay. Um, they have agreed with the planning board, and I think it should probably be a condition that the conservation restriction is submitted to the state by the first building permit. Um, and what was it, Bruce? It should be finalized by? <coughs> we, we set up, um, Marin and I set up that we would file by the first building permit and that um, we would have a state approval before the issuance of the 21st out of 24 occupancy permits. The emphasis with that is, is that um, the push is on us to file with the state, you know, work out the, the CR, which should be a pretty straightforward CR because it's a fairly straightforward area. Um, it's the emphasis is on us to get that worked out with the applicants council, Amy, Marin and town council well in advance of the first of the going for the um, first building permit so that we have ample time for the state to go slow in this COVID days and not hold us up on the other end. Because the, the type of structures that are being built, the pre-sales that are happening, when this thing goes up, I have a feeling it's gonna go up fast and everybody's gonna be wanting to move in as soon as things are ready. So, um, you know, we're tr the emphasis is on us to get our draft ready sooner rather than later. Okay. So Amy, has everything been addressed to your knowledge? I believe so, yes. I think this commitment letter was the last piece of it. So is it your wish for us to close this? It is our wish to close this. Okay. Is there a commissioner that would like to make a motion for this notice of intent? Uh, DEP 204916. Make a motion to close the hearing and issue an order of conditions pursuant to the discussions we've had um, for DEP 204 what? 916. 916. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Carl? Who was that? I missed it. Was that Kyle? Kyle. Uh, yep. All right. Um, all in favor, Carl, aye. Brian Crowley. Brian Crowley, aye. Kyle Maxfield. Kyle Maxfield, aye. Andrew Samarco. Andrew Samarco, aye. Sarah Seward. Sarah Seward, aye. James Pickard. James Pickard, aye. Julie Rupp. Julie Rupp, aye. Hey, unanimous. Thank you. Good luck. Stay Thank in you all very much for your time. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Good Bruce. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 845. We'll move on to the continued public hearing request for amended order of conditions 151 Taylor, uh, DEP 204906, which is also at the same time as DEP 204917. Anyone here to speak to that? Uh, I'm here. Uh, my name is Larry Beals. Um, I'm with Beals Associates. Uh, we have the whole team. I, I think after all these hearings, you pretty much know who we are and what we're trying to accomplish. So I'll dispense with the uh, introductions. And uh, we met with you a couple of weeks ago, and I think it, uh, it had boiled down to really four outstanding issues. And uh, we addressed those issues in a letter to the Conservation Commission that was dated November 10th, uh, 2020. We sent that in. I assume you've taken a look at it. Uh, I think it makes sense just for me to hit the highlights and then we can go into as much detail or as little detail as the commission prefers. So one of the items that we offered last week that I think the commission thought was a good idea is on the driveway it goes between the two wetland areas where we're uh, close to the wetlands. Uh, we provided a heat, heated pavement section. So that will be heated throughout the winter. There will not be any need to spread the icing compounds in those areas. And um, it provides a greater degree of protection for the wetlands. So we've added that feature to the plans, to the final plan set. And um, if the commission uh, closes the hearing issues in order of conditions that would be referenced in the order. 
the second item that we discussed was uh, trash to some extent, and we have added a detail to the plans and a perimeter uh, trash collector, I guess we would call it. It's really a, a wood safety uh, guide rail around the perimeter of the parking lot. And then we've added a uh, chain link mesh detail to that so that any trash blowing across the surface of the parking lot uh, would be trapped and prevented from going into the wetlands. Uh, the letter that I referenced has that detail. And then uh, we also suggested, uh, I think the point was used as an example of a well-maintained uh, parking area. And so we updated our stormwater operation and maintenance manual, manual to uh, specify that both trash removal and parking lot sweeping will occur on a weekly basis. So that's been memorialized in the operation and maintenance uh, manual. And then we, um, the fourth item was, we suggested a groundwater monitoring program. Uh, we've talked about de-icing compounds. We've talked about limiting the use of it. And then uh, we recommended a monitoring program to have a um, well upstream of the site to evaluate the water, the groundwater coming onto the site, uh, monitoring wells uh, down gradient from the site. Uh, we specified locations for those monitoring wells in the letter uh, on a plan that we submitted. And really the intent is to <clears throat> minimize the amount of the icing compound that we spread on the site, um, evaluate the water flowing onto the site, evaluate the water flowing off of the site, and do all that independently and then correlate those data with uh, the Littleton Water Department. Uh, the D Water Department has its own monitoring wells. It's responsible for collecting and evaluating those samples. And uh, at the end of each year, as specified in our program, we'll provide uh, the results of our, um, the quantity of the icing compound spread and the results of our testing. And we'll try to correlate it with the Water Department. So uh, those, I think, were the outstanding issues. Um, we can discuss those in detail. Uh, I think that this permit process has worked extremely well. We've had four meetings. Uh, a number of issues have been brought up that uh, we tried to uh, respond to. And I think what we have before you is a better design than when we came in here uh, four meetings ago. So. Um, we feel good about it because we think we've protected the eight interests, the Wetlands Protection Act. And um, if it's agreeable to the commission, we'll stay here all night and answer any questions or comments, but we'd like to get to the point where perhaps you would consider closing the hearing and issuing an order of conditions. So I, I said- thank you, I to... for, thank you, Larry, for your update. Um, you may have missed us at the beginning. So we are very much uh, staying on track with a lot of our, our timing. We have had great deals of, of conversation, I think very valuable discussion. Um, I, what I'd like to do is open it to the commissioners to see if they have any questions on any of those four points or anything else. Um, I just had a quick question on the monitoring. Wells, just to, um, is did we, come to the conclusion that they were going to be just monitored annually, or are we going to do them on a more frequent basis? I think during that construction, that uh, conversation that we had the last time, it was going to be at least twice a year, perhaps. Um, they all lined up pretty good in their letter, right? Yeah, yes, we did. And I didn't know there was going to be a quiz on the specifics tonight. It says quarterly. quarterly. For five quarterly. Years. Yes, yes. Quarterly. Um, and and that's, that's independent of the the way we view this is the water department will control its wells and our da data simply supplements uh, right. their yeah. testing and, program. Okay, right. Okay, any other commissioners have questions? Yeah, Sarah, can I follow up on the wells? Um, I just said it probably is just a semantics issue. In the letter, you indicate you're gonna install one well at 50, 153 and one at 151. On the plans, the updated plans that you submitted, there's actually two wells on each other. No, Todd's already laughing. Uh, there's two wells on either property. <laughs> We, we had this discussion. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we did. I, I think I should have phrased that letter to say a, a pair of wells on each property. Okay. Um, each property we're installing two wells on. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Anyone else have any other questions? No, 
I was going to ask about the wells too, but Kyle covered it. Um, I had another question about restrooms. And I, so there was an article that just came out about this development and the planning board talking about the restrooms. And I know we talked in great deal detail about restrooms and urination of truckers off, off the parking lot. And I thought you were going to have restrooms. So I just wanted to circle back to that question. And I know the parking lot, there wasn't planned for plumbing there, but I thought there was going to be restrooms available to drivers. I thought that was in the new plan. So I was just wondering if you could clarify that piece. Sure. Um, great question. And if you have the letter in front of you, or I can put it up on the screen, if you look at the final plan that we attached to that letter, it's drawing C3.0B. Uh, and uh, in answer to your question, Julie, uh, we are proposing to uh, put a building on 153 that will be sort of a single purpose building. It'll be for restrooms. And um, if you look at the, that final drawing, it's clouded in red. You'll see a uh, building and a leach field. It is uh, outside of the buffer zone, obviously, because uh, you can't build a leach field within a buffer zone. So uh, we, we're providing this information to you. I think it's more of a planning board issue and a board of health issue at this point but uh, we can certainly include it. It'll be included on the final set of plans. Or we could add nutrients to your monitoring plan. Sure. Um, uh, I, feel, I feel as though providing a restroom for your drivers is, is fine, but our, um, our waterways, it's, it's DO, uh, low DO are our impairments kind of across the board um, in our lakes and watershed areas, so. Sure, we're putting the wells in, and if we, if you'd like us to add nutrients to the um, menu of what's being tested, we can do that. Um, you know, I know the, the assumption under Title V is if you're 100 feet away from the edge of a wetland, uh, there's adequate uh, filtration of the effluent before it reaches the wetlands. Yeah, I, the I was just thinking about be, public. Like I was thinking more about um, nature, use of nature instead of a restroom. So if you're providing a restroom, I'm happy. Okay, okay. Uh, the drivers will be happy too. Um, but I, I think it's, you know, as I said, I think the project's gotten better. It, it, it would have functioned without the restroom, but it functions better now that uh, people have suggested that we do it. So we're doing it. Um, so does that answer the question on, on uh, sampling? Okay, good, thank you. Isn't there already a septic system on both lots? There currently is a septic system. <laughs> they, were, they were separate buildings. Uh, they were substantially larger. You know, the, if you add up both lots, I think the design flows are pretty close uh, to 20,000 gallons a day. Uh, but I mean, it, could you still use that septic system on either lot for a moderate sized restroom? I mean, it seems like that wouldn't be unreasonable. You know, the, um, the testing that was done originally, that I did originally for those is out of date. Uh, we're, we're just starting brand new. Uh, okay. Current testing, uh, groundwater evaluations, and I'm sure Neshoba would insist on uh, brand new testing. And you know, we'd have to inspect the existing systems and they'll probably be damaged during demolition. So it's, it's better for everybody concerned to start with a brand new system. Mm -hmm. Amy, is there anything else um, to be addressed? I believe they have gotten it all. You've got two things to, to close and vote on. And actually the only thing I would ask is it, is that you just, send me a revision of your November 10th letter and just make it clear about the two pairs of the wells. And so that's easy. I, we don't need to hold anything up for that, I don't think. We'll take care of that. It's uh, in the minutes. So Sarah? Yep. Uh, I just wanna make sure that we make note, I believe there was some kind of discussion about a donation. Could we recall that discussion and make sure that we have that? Yep. Larry, do you wanna discuss that? Uh, sure, I, I think, 
And and I, I'm just going by memory right now. So if I'm uh, getting the wrong numbers, I will stand to be corrected. But uh, Amy, you and I have talked about this a little bit. And I think on the original proposal, we were donating money to the tree fund. And I, I can't recall whether it was twenty or forty thousand dollars that we had mentioned. You it, it was twenty thousand. Okay, I was going to say forty, but yeah, I think. Well, yeah, sorry, you know. <laughs> I think you've established a rule that if it's twenty thousand dollars a site, and if we're doing two sites, it gets you to forty thousand. Right, I, and I it was to the tree fund. Yep. Yeah. Well, and, and, and it was discussed since there isn't a tree fund and because there's an issue with establishing a tree fund, apparently, that it was going to be go towards the um, uh, the brown parcel purchase, which is trees. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we, we Northbridge mitigated the first site. Uh, they're happy to mitigate. Well, I'm speaking for them. They're happy to mitigate for this site as well. And if, and um, the simple math is two times 20 is $40,000. If that's acceptable, we'll commit to that. Okay. Amy, would you like that in writing at some point? It, it's up to you guys. The donation would be going through the select board um, okay. for the purposes of, of this. So I, I don't. Well, just, just to be clear, Amy, why don't we shoot you an email in the morning saying, as we discussed, we'll uh, work with the select board to, and, and that, that way we have something to send to the select board as well. Yeah. Okay. That would be appreciated. So from a procedural standpoint, if um, we're going to close one at a time, so why don't we go ahead and start with uh, R10-14-0, MassDEP 204-906. Is there a commissioner that would like to uh, make a motion? And that is to um, approve the request for minute order conditions. Correct. So moved. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. Carl? Roll call. Carl Melberg, aye. Brian Crowley? Brian Crowley, aye. Kyle Maxfield? Kyle Maxfield, aye. Andrew Samarco? Andrew Samarco, aye. Sarah Seward? Sarah Seward, aye. James Pickard? James Pickard, aye. Julie Rupp? Julie Rupp, aye. It's unanimous. Okay. And then moving on to also known um, 153 Taylor Street, R10-14-1, Mass DEP 204 917. Do we have a motion? So moved. We have a second. Second. And Carl? Roll call. Carl Melberg. Aye. Brian Crowley. Brian Crowley, aye. Kyle Maxfield. Kyle Maxfield, aye. Andrew Samarco. Andrew Samarco, aye. Sarah Seward. Sarah Seward, aye. James Pickard. James Pickard, aye. Julie Rupp. Julie Rupp, aye. Okay, unanimous. Okay. Thank you all. Good luck. Thank you very much for your Thank time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you, guys. Very, very good job. Thank you. Right, good luck. Thank you. Okay, it's 9.10, and we will go ahead. We are ahead now for 9.15 for our Wickham. Amy, are all the next four in attendance? Uh, no, the Keolis um, and continued. I did do the training. Um, they are reviewing the maps, the comments I had on the maps. Um, and then once they finish that, hopefully I'll have my ID and we can set up the site walk. And then 195 to Hadawan Healy Corner um, uh, also asked to be continued. I had to call in there because I hadn't heard back from them when I had to set up the agenda. So those are both gone. Okay. So we do have just a few minutes. If there's any other procedurally, we have about five minutes before we can go on to um, Wickham Ave Smith property. Um, how are we doing for administrative? items any uh well, was there anything else on the budget and goals amy have you uh, what how does oak hill work um i know we've had we've gone back and forth with this i was out there a week a week and a half ago and it's not as bad as it was but it's the reeling is starting again the erosion is yeah. it's 
not going to, I just, if, if it's something that we're going to have to keep putting money into, you're going to, like I said, this is the second time now this year already. So. Yeah, it's, it, it needs what I'll just call a big solution um, that I um, think we'd have to, to budget along with the water department and highway or something. It's, it's kind of outside of the regular Oat Hill budget. I have no idea how much it'll be. Um, I'm guessing though that it probably won't happen in 2022. So we'll still be here a year with a temporary fix maybe in it. Um, yeah. Unless someone gets really motivated to try to move something forward. Is that on their radar as well as it's on ours to keep that discussion coming? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. They just soon, I, 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 am, I am assuming they'd probably just rather keep dumping gravel. Okay. And, and it's a problem because it's, it's, a, it's a very steep slope. And if you're going to do it right, you're going to be changing that road. Right. Okay. And then the other question I had was the, uh, the site across from the field development on Air Road. Um, that looks like it's completed the, the wetland impacts that they, they cleaned out and installed the reinstalled the culvert or cleaned out the culvert yeah they, they did all the work and then when we went out to to, to look at it um the head wall had had sunk a little bit so they had to go back out and fix that so i think they're still working on that last piece of it but they did they took all the sediment out and the rest of it looks stable so it's just that <clears throat> finishing touch if you will it'll be very interesting to see how that holds up over the winter and with plowing and frosting of roads and it'll be interesting. Okay. Okay. Why don't we go ahead and it's nine 13. We can go ahead and start to open up um, Smith property uh, continued public hearing notice of intent one nine nine Wickham Ave Smith property R 13 five, six, seven, and eight, eight. Who so who is here to- Yes, I'm Laura Matei. I'm the Director of Stewardship with Sudbury Valley Trustees. And with me this evening is Karen Paquin, our Board President, and Lisa Vernegard, our Executive Director. Um, <clears throat> Karen Paquin, our Board President, will make an initial statement um, about the process in our proposal before I go into um, some of the answers to your questions. Karen, are you there? I am. Thank you, Laura. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to make a few comments this evening. Uh, we recognize that the use of herbicides can be controversial and that um, any potential impacts must be very carefully considered uh, when herbicide use is a part of an invasives control plan. Um, as SVT does not take these decisions lightly. As the SVT board president, I would like commission members and Smith neighbors to know that the board has been kept up to date on the Smith project. In fact, members of the board, myself included, attended the two meetings held last year on site to inform neighbors about the management plan to battle oriental bittersweet infestations at Smith and to hear questions and concerns voiced by neighbors. In response, SVT staff decided to pause the plan to do intensive research into best management practices for the use of herbicides in those circumstances. Earlier this year, the SVT board formed a subcommittee of board members of which I'm a member to ensure that the board remains informed on the process as well as neighbors concerns. About two weeks before the November 2nd Conservation Commission meeting, Laura Matei held a Zoom presentation for neighbors and other interested parties to discuss the findings of the year's research and to outline current management plans. An opportunity for neighbors to ask additional questions and voice concerns was given during this presentation. Then at the November 2nd commission hearing, commissioners and neighbors asked additional good questions and the meeting was then continued to this evening to give SVT the opportunity to um, address these issues. Um, let me emphasize that the board has great confidence in the staff and in the research, the management planning and uh, community outreach being done at Smith for this project. 
And um, finally, I would like to mention the great conservation partnership between SVT, the town of Littleton and the Littleton Conservation Trust who continue to work together to protect and care for the land in Littleton. Uh, Smith Conservation Land is truly a special place and we really wanna see a good outcome here. And uh, I thank you. Thanks, Karen. Um, so to the commissioners, neighbors and other community residents uh, obviously would like to be assured that the proposed project will not endanger human or environmental health. And I'm just gonna say a few uh, larger points about how that relates to the proposal. The testing and reviews of the herbicides in question by regulatory authorities and uh, chemical analysts, including additional review in Massachusetts are designed to be conservative such that the maximum allowed usage of an herbicide will not pose a risk to human health and the environment. We understand that there are different viewpoints about this and that some people's philosophies, they just don't wanna use them at all. And we understand that. SVT and our partners have done our due diligence in taking a closer look at the science, as well as the practices in the field and the results. We believe that the limited use of herbicides will yield a net benefit to the habitats and not endanger human health. In invasive plant management, the amounts of herbicides that are used are well below the maximum allowed rates, which further assures that we're not posing those risks. The methodology that SVT is proposing to use on this property is considered a best management practice for conservation land managers. This best management practice is used by all of the statewide conservation organizations and agencies as well as many local and regional land trusts and municipalities. And this includes being used in wetlands and wetland buffer zones. The DEP has reviewed our notice of intent and has not expressed concerns. The Massachusetts Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program has formally approved the management plan at the site which supports rare species. Um, I will share my screen to show you the updated map. And I will enlarge this, I hope, so that you can see it better as well. Okay, that brings us in a little bit closer. So um, the eastern half of our property starting more or less here. Can you see my cursor? Yep. Okay. yep. Um, going in this direction is about 26 acres. The um, portions of that that actually have bittersweet on them is about um, 22 acres. So these acres in this area in here around this vernal pool, this patch here, the sugar maple stand and this knoll over here, amazingly enough, do not have bittersweet. Um, so the area across which we may use herbicides is 18 acres. In the first year, we will only be treating 12 acres that's one unit one, two, and some of the larger stems in five. We proposed a cut and paint methodology followed by a backpack foliar spray only to patches of low growing bittersweet. The spray application will occur not more than three times once each year after the initial cut and paint. We have designated three and a half acres that we will not use herbicides on that will be mechanical only treatment. Those areas include the 125 foot buffers around residential wells, here, here. It also includes some additional residential activity buffers and it includes also the western margin of our uh, invasive management area. 
The, um, we are also proposing additionally a modification for the management within the 50 foot buffer zone from the wetlands. So we will not spray in that 50 foot buffer. That's our proposal. Um, and uh, we would do the cut and paint and then um, use uh, mechanical manual removal techniques. The, um, and then the commission had questions about the areas within the buffer zones. So along the Beaverbrook marshes to the east, the total within the 100 foot buffer area is 4.6 acres. The total within the 100 foot buffer that's in units one and two is 3.8 acres. Then within the 50 foot buffer along here, this whole area is about 2.3 acres. To the west of Whitcomb Avenue, the area within the 100 foot buffer area is 1.2 acres. Some of the specific questions that the commission asked uh, the first two questions were essentially about the specifics of the herbicides, their breakdown products, how they move through soils, wetlands, and water. And I did send along some information to all of you that was provided to me by Hotza Vanya. Uh, he's the environmental chemist at MDAR. It's pretty dense. There's a lot there. Um, I certainly will not say that I'm an expert in um, the chemical and environmental analysis. I've reviewed materials as well as I know many of you have, um, and I don't know, and I'm, I'm not gonna go into detail on that, um, but we can go back to that again at the end of this. Um, one of the questions that you ask is if can, spraying can be avoided altogether. And um, I have modified our proposal to eliminate spraying from the 50 foot buffer zone after the initial cut and paint. We'll use just manual removal. In terms of avoiding spraying altogether, we do not believe that is feasible and we don't think that really makes sense, principally because it won't allow us to be as effective. We we believe that we can devote a certain amount of resources and time to doing mechanical manual removal. And the use, the very limited use of the herbicides really helps us to be more effective in the long term. We have followed up on some of the leads that have been given to us about where people have used mechanical control. And um, we already had looked at some of those and of, of those that have been successful, it's been on a, a limited size area, which as long as you can put in that type of manpower consistently on a smaller area, it can be done. We also did look at the results in Acton that Noel Hermit had worked on, and we really were impressed with his method, which as I understand it is a very uh, methodical root, I call it a methodical root extraction technique. And I've been in touch with Noel about providing a training to our staff and volunteers because I would like to try to uh, replicate that and see how that works for us. Um, there was a question about the metrics to determine when spraying is no longer necessary. Our metric goal would be under 10% or 10% or less of bittersweet. However, we are, will not use a spray application more than three times um, that once per year. And our, our uh, theory on that is that if we can do some of that initial limited herbicide work, we can get the bittersweet level down enough that we can do mechanical control. That's also the reason why we've decided to phase the project is to really make sure that we can succeed because we don't want to start on more than we can actually manage. There was um, a question for the estimate of the total volume of herbicides that might be used. 
We cannot predict how much would be used at Smith because um, it really varies by site conditions. And so until someone has really gone in there and started doing the work, they really couldn't predict. What I can tell you is that the percent concentration used in the cut and dab methodology is 25%. And the percent concentration used for spray application is 4%. So it is lower with the spray application. At a bittersweet site that we treated earlier this year, I can tell you that the amount of active ingredient used, so not the full tank mix that has a lot of water in it, but the specific active ingredient varied from four ounces to 42 ounces per acre. Uh, again, there was a question about how can we ensure that there's no overspray or non-target impacts. Um, I have observed the use of these battery operated backpack sprayers and I have seen the results. And I've been very impressed with the very low level of non-target impacts. The pressure in the backpack sprayers is adjustable. The sprayers have a narrow angle of spray that sprays in a flat pattern. So the applicator can be very directed at small targets, especially with lower pressure. And our applicator shared with me that since they generally get rather good control in the first cut stump treatment, the amount of chemical applied in follow-up sprays is very small in comparison. So those are, um, I think the main questions answered. The only question that I didn't go into detail on was some of the, the questions about the mobility of the chemicals and such. It's, it's a lot of technical information that, um, again, I don't profess to be an expert. I have some of those documents here. Um, so I'm going to open it up for, uh, for questions and comments. Thanks. Let's go ahead and start with commissioners if they have any specific questions for Laura. I got a question. On your kiosk, would you post when the application has taken place and what the re-entry time would be? Yes, we, we do typically post the kiosk. We'll also send out an email to all of the neighbors and stakeholders on our list. The, um, the spray, even just the, the stump will dry uh, within a half an hour approximately. So what we'll do is on the day of the application, we advise people that it's happening. We'll typically just close the trail, especially here because that's very doable. Um, it's just easier that way, you know, and then the next day it's, it's perfectly safe for people to be using the trails. Hi, this is uh, Anna. Um, wondering after you do the cut and dab to mm -hmm. the larger stems, what are you going to do with the bittersweet that's already up in the trees? Is that going to be pulled down or how do you manage? Probably that? not. Um, we'll probably just leave it there for now, but especially in the, um, the red pine area, we're going to have to take those out eventually anyway. It will, it just, it dies and it hangs there. It might not look that nice at first, but. Other commissioners with questions? I know that we probably have some audience members that would like to ask questions. Um, I saw two, one from Rick Finley and one from Robert Stevens. Sarah, I had one question. Sure. Um, so I just wanted to note that um, it sounds like the rise plan is to not spray within the 50 foot buffer um, and then I thought it was also important to clarify our jurisdiction, which is, you know, the hundred foot buffer of the wetlands, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we would, we, you know, the fate and transport questions were related to 
you know, protecting the watershed. And so that that is also important. Um, but I wanted to just be really clear on what our jurisdiction is. Correct. As far as Understood. that goes. And then mm -hmm. I did have a question. So, so like you cut, you know, cut and dab the big stuff and then some of the smaller guys, you know, that you get the smaller sprouts come back the next year. Um, and they're, you know, small, individual, spindly, um, usually in my observation, um, I certainly could also be wrong. Um, but my question is how, um, I could see challenges with, you know, spraying non-target areas in that instance. Um, and so I guess I have concerns with m more so with the subsequent um, non-target herbicide application for like the smaller regrowth? So um, I think you meant to say that differently. <laughs> There's a, a targeted application with the spray and you're concerned about non-target impacts. Right, non-target impacts when you're spraying um, the small regrowth because- Right, right. So it would be a concentrated area of regrowth, of low regrowth with the foliar. If, if it's just a little um, spindly um, plant, like a seedling, that we can pull out by hand. So you wouldn't, so if there was a, like a wide area of little seedlings sprouting up, that wouldn't be sprayed? Not if it's not, if, if it's just bittersweet and they're close enough together so that you could effectively get the bittersweet, you could do that. If there's just little seedlings spaced out, that wouldn't make sense. Okay. So you wouldn't, that was my question. You wouldn't plan. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you see what it actually looks like afterward on these kind of areas, it, I think it would be more apparent. Um, if, Thank you. if they're just little, little seedlings, then, then those are pluckable. Hi, you mentioned, um, this is Anna again, you mentioned no spray within the 50. You also mentioned uh, something about the, from the 50 to the 100. Could you clarify again what is going to happen between the 50 and the 100 line? The 50 and, and the 100 would be the, the, um, the protocol of the cut and paint followed by the, the, the limited spray. So there's nothing different between the 50 and the 100 as you would elsewhere outside of the 100. Correct. Unless the commission said they didn't want us to do that. So the you're going to be spring how many times, how many years in a row? So it would be once annually for up to 3. Up to 3 and you'll be mon and you'll monitor Prior to the next year's spring, will it be a monitoring done? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Monitor every year to see what's happening. And it may be that we only need to do two, um, but I, I couldn't say until we can see how it works. So would, would, would that monitoring report come to the Conservation Commission? Yes. Yes, definitely. I would put together an annual report to share with you and neighbors and other stakeholders. And Laura, that was that is different from what we heard last time, I think, or at least from what I recall last time, the three year limit. What's different? That there's a three year limit on the spraying versus in perpetuity spraying. I don't think I ever said in perpetuity, but yeah, that might have been what the neighbor said. Right. I think we discussed a three year. I'm okay. encouraged to hear that the that there will be opportunity for. It seems like a lot more monitoring that if we don't have to spray, that we will go back to hand removal as well. So I think that discussion is is um, better guided than in the past. Any other commissioners have any questions? If not, I'd like to open it up. Amy, you said that there are some questions or hands raised. Rick? Uh, I've, actually, I've got uh, one question. Is So area four is not part of this notice of intent? 
Um, that's a good question. Maybe I should share that again. Hold on one second. Sorry, just as you. <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to sh keep sharing the map, but be able to see more people. Yeah, you can't really. Mm, no, I don't know what's going on here. No, sorry. Oh, wait, there we go. Sorry. So area four, um, that's a good question because depending on what happens in one, two, I'm not sure when we'd start on four. Um, but I think it would make sense, at least for now, to include it. If we don't get to it, you don't get to it, but at least it's included. Laura, have there been any maps produced um, that show kind of the density of uh, bittersweet growth and where you know the real problem areas are? Um, well, what I can tell you, I don't have, I, I mapped the locations of the invasive plants, but not the densities per se. So, but what I can tell you is that um, you can see I put in some zeros in here because in the, in the, in the, larger portion of the mode field, you don't have it hardly at all. Um, there's some really denser areas in two all along in, in this area in here. This is pretty bad. Um, in one, it's, um, it's not overwhelming except in the, this middle uh, depression area here. Um, so it's, it, the biomass is, is more up in the vines that go up the pine trees there. Um, is this helping you at all to answer your question? Yeah. So, um, it's somewhat variable, uh, but again, uh, one and two are, um, the, the more challenging areas. Okay, so let, let's carry on with discussion. Amy, coming back to you, so... I think I got three, uh, Rick Finley. Okay, let's go ahead and start with Rick, if you'd like to unmute and... Um, Assuming he still wants to say something. Uh, hi, uh, going back to area four, I think there are significant large vines that would uh, respond well to a cut and paint situation um, on the edges back. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would keep that, I would definitely keep that in. And then right. you could probably go to manual right after, right after that. Okay. Um, I just wanted to express the support of the Conservation Trust, uh, re reiterate that. Laura, I think you're doing a wonderful job and uh, really, really appreciate it. Uh, we've been involved in... Uh, trying to clean up areas like Cloverdale and other areas in town. And uh, you've given it more attention than I think we did. So uh, it's, a learning, it's a learning process for me. And I, I really appreciate it. That was it. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick. Amy, others in queue? Uh, Robert Stevens. Hi, my name is Robert Stevens. Uh, my wife and I live on Moore Lane, and we've lived in town since 1972. Um, I am opposed to any chemicals being introduced into the uh, land, um, especially near the aquifer here or any place else in town. It just sounds like another DDT story coming up, and somebody will write another silent spring in 20 years because we'll have... Um, unintended consequences. So especially for me, the risk is far greater th than the benefit of removing some bittersweet. I, I just don't want to see the chemicals introduced into the ground. Okay. And then Walsh. Hi. Um, so you know, the, the conversation, I'm sorry, I need your name address. Oh. Kadra Walsh, 189 Whitcomb Avenue. Um, we've been hearing about how these chemicals are mostly water, 
But to me, that just tells me that these are extremely toxic, given that they can kill these this this volume of plants even with significant dilution. Um, metsul, met sulfuron methyl has been shown to be a, a metabolic disruptor in chronic and subchronic toxicity studies. Um, it's an indirect neurotoxin, and no studies have been conducted on major hormone systems um, or the immune system. Uh, adverse liver and kidney effects and hematological changes and statistically significant increases in adrenal gland tumors have all been noted in animal studies of triclopyr. So we can't overlook that these chemicals are also considered in lo low risk in part because many studies haven't taken place yet. The EPA also states that it doesn't have sufficient data for metrosulfuran methyl on pollinators and therefore hasn't even assessed the potential risk of it to terrestrial invertebrate. Thank you. Oh, I think we have an, a sound issue again. Oh, you do. ...from spraying that um, the Smiths had previously approved Littleton Conservation Trust to um, do. And, you know, the, the idea that low or off target spray visibly isn't showing any problems isn't a scientific statement. So given that we don't know the quantity of chemicals even going to be used, it's an unreasonable request for those of us who have to live intimately with the water, the aquifer and the land. Thank you. And I did not see any other hands as I'm scrolling through here. Oh, wait. Uh, I mean, Joanne is raising her hand. That's a physical person. hand. Thank you very much. My name is Joanna Glennon, and I actually live in Concord. Uh, so I'm approaching this more from the uh, uh, standpoint of somebody in the, the larger community interested in the environment and of course also also my neighbors in Littleton. Uh, what I've been hearing um, uh, today is very interesting in that um, a lot of the um, concern about having what what might ultimately be considered a you know a best practice approach maybe 10 years from now, you know, because best practice in all things is a kind of an exponential moving average. Um, hand pulling might be soon considered to be a best practice, but it was considered to be difficult in this case because of 26 acres. But now it, it is more clear that the 26 acres, when you look at the intensity of the problem is, you know, you know at first you were going to approach 12 acres and now it's actually parcel two and parts of parcel one that are most intensely affected. And it does really raise the question as to whether it might be overall a, a, a more logical decision uh, from the human health and the conservation standpoint to start with something that is going to uh, have um, a, a lesser impact on the community. Um, especially because the, the range of product used, you know, four ounces sounds like very little, four ounces an acre, but, but it could be uh, a multiple of 10 times that, right? Four ounces to 42 ounces is a big range. Uh, and if you started uh, on that three-year program with a very intense uh, program of pulling in those most affected areas, especially, especially where uh, the biomass is, you know, up in the trees, right? So if you cut it off, you're, you know, there you solve that, um, uh, that that might be a more prudent approach uh, for this generation and for the future generations that obviously you were holding the land in trust for, because we don't want to find that we're just exchanging one evil for another evil. Uh, that would not be progress. Thank you. Thank you. you mean, anything anything else? Uh, someone's called an iPad. They have their hand raised. Uh, yeah, but they're muted. Okay. And there's a, there's no name on it. He's gonna have to unmute himself. Okay. 
Are there any other questions that commissioners have for for Laura or um, pertaining to the site and applications? Hey, Sarah, I see a woman named Sandy Murray has been waving her hand. Okay. <laughs> Sandy, go, Sandy, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Sandy and David Murray, 169 Whitcomb. Uh, we're in a kind of an unusual situation in that we are Littleton residents and have been for many, many years, but we're also members of the SAT. And we have been very, hmm, yep. we have been very uh, uh, appreciative and, uh, and we, uh, positive about the way SVT has managed its properties, particularly the Smith property that we were so interested in. Uh, until now. What has happened is that uh, I appreciate all of Laura's uh, uh, maps and everything else. Uh, I think she's done an amazing job. Uh, the 100 foot buffer zone is what I have a question about. The, and this is the 100 foot buffer. Uh, I'm really pleased to see that they are dividing it so that it wouldn't be sprayed in as much area. But my question to you is what do you really consider a buffer zone? To me, when you're next to water supplies and everything else, that's the one area where you don't touch it. That's why it's called a buffer zone. So uh, to me, you can go before that or outside the area, but not within it at all. And remember, these waterways are stocked with trout uh, and they have you know, uh, groundwater, etc. I hope that in addressing the last lady's comments, uh, we already have a well that is compromised in Littleton. We don't need another one that is just downstream from where they plan to do the spraying. So to us, uh, spraying doesn't make any sense within a 100 foot buffer zone. Can you define what you really define, uh, mean as a buffer zone and why you would want a variance? Is that question to me or the commission? E either one. I think to the commission probably. So I guess I'll take the question since I referenced the, our jurisdictional area and the buffer zone. And so the 100 foot buffer zone is the jurisdictional area um, that is designated by the state of Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act um, to be the area of influence for wetlands or waterways. Okay, but why would anyone even consider unbuffering it by spraying or doing anything else? So that people develop in the buffer zone and that's right. you know, what we most often see. And you can, you can conduct activities in the buffer zone and it's, um, it's basically your your boundary that says, hey, wait a minute, we need to do more evaluation um, to determine what impacts there may be and then the risk, the risk benefit. Um, and if others wanna weigh in, I'm happy for them too. Laura, do you wanna weigh in on the opportunity of staying out of the out of the buffer zone and how that might impact your project? If we don't, um, well, I guess there's a couple of alternatives. One is not to do anything in the buffer zone. Two is to possibly attempt mechanical only in the buffer zone, which I would be concerned about. Three is cut and dab. Uh, then do mechanical or do the um, cut and dab and followed by the spray. but all within that buffer zone, now you're adding all the chemicals within the buffer zone that we wanted to avoid. So it's our understanding, and I realize that people are disputing this, but it's our understanding that these are approved for sensitive areas. So I backed off of um, the 50 feet, and if the commission says they really think we shouldn't do anything in there at all, then I will have to do it that way. I say one thing 
Mm -hmm. I'll say Mr. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Rick Finley, if I could say, uh, we haven't talked too much about half-lives and uh, the half-life of these herbicides is fairly short and uh, it's not going to exist in the soils uh, in a couple in a couple of years, essentially. So it's a couple of years. It's a couple of years. A couple of years. Yes, it may be sitting there, but it's going to disappear. It's going to be gone. What does it break down to? to it nothing. doesn't vaporize. It breaks down to nothing. Nothing breaks down to nothing. No, yeah. no, not at all. You have <laughs> chemists here in this group. <laughs> no. Yes, it it basically. Can you speak to the half lives, Laura? Bird. They break down into the different daughter products. There's a certain mobility for some of those. Um, what are the daughter products? For triclopyr, it's triclopyr acid, is my understanding. Um, but I think what I think what Rick was trying to say is that um, there's a, there's a certain amount that gets absorbed by the plants. There's a certain amount that's in the soil near where it goes through the roots and the plants. And then there's another certain amount that will go through. And again, none of us are the chemical analysts on these. So it's going to be, I, we have to look at those studies that were done to see, uh, is this a risk or not? Can, can I make a quick comment? This is Jesse Walsh, 189 with Kamav. Yes, go ahead. Um, um, I was looking over the EPA document on uh, product registration for triclopyr, and there are concerns around um, triclopyr being remaining persistent even after composting, even after passing through the intestinal tract of an animal that has consumed uh, plant matter that is treated with triclopyr to and that compost has herbicidal uh, qualities and this was posted by this was among the materials that Laura posted for us to read um, also among those materials was a recommendation that it not be sprayed within a thousand feet of bees anyone keeping bees and we keep bees um, and also with regard to like direct spraying, if 10 miles per hour, if wind is blowing 10 miles per hour, any water droplet that enters that wind is traveling 14.6 feet per second. And so if you put water droplets into that air, I don't think you're gonna be hitting just the leaves because I don't think we're talking about plants quite that size. Um, also, it was mentioned last meeting that the area is flat, but there's actually a 40 foot drop in elevation from Wickham Ave down to the wetlands. I wouldn't refer to that as flat. Also, if SBG has mechanical only removal areas, why not just do that in the wetland buffer also? Like why risk it? Um, in the wetland, so anyways, uh, in the cut and dab application, you're putting a higher concentration of more chemical on the stem of a plant that's going to be sucked down into the roots and be buried in the ground and obviously mingle with the groundwater right next to a wetland. I don't, and if there's no sunlight hitting it, that affects the decomposition. Um, and if it's persistent enough to be in compost, I don't think we want that there. And that's the end of my comment. Thank you. And the gentleman who couldn't get it uh, was identified as iPad, I think, has his. Uh... Uh, this is Don Armstrong. I'm on the, I'm the iPad guy. I, it, it seems to me and I'm sorry, that we should have the water commissioners review this plan in the town of Littleton because we've had problems in two wells in Littleton. And now the, the well that doesn't have problem, we're putting chemicals upstream from it. It just doesn't seem to make sense to me from, from people that have water. Plus I live on 
moorland and I have a well that gets impacted but when there's a drought. So if the, the cone of influence, it sucks water from a long distance to get well water. It, it's very, this is very dangerous, I think, for the water in Littleton. That's all I have to say. Uh, Jesse Walsh again, look back. The, the whole... Oops. That whole area is a zone two water protection area also. Whoever whoever is talking, you need to identify get it be identified by the uh the chair. Okay. So let let's go back to the commissioners. So um we thank all the abutters for their comments and um feedback. So, any other commissioners that have any questions that they would like to address or have any thoughts? Amy, did we um did we run this by Corey at all or the water department? And I think you said you were trying to <coughs> ask Board of Health. Was there any success in in that? Not not huge success. Um, Corey, who is with a little with the Littleton Water Department and helps run the Clean Lakes Committee, um, basically said, um, and and this wasn't off the cuff, but it wasn't a deep analysis, obviously. It doesn't see any reason to be specifically concerned. The blend being used is tailored so that most of the herbicide is taken up by the plants and it aims to keep it out of soil groundwater. And then uh, Jim Graffy was supposed to get me something. He's the uh, health agent in town um, and he didn't. Um, but <laughs> initial conversations with him were that the Board of Health really doesn't have a lot of jurisdiction here as long as the pesticides are being used you know, off the label as the label requires. Okay. Um, so I guess, you know, I've thought about, um, so my background, as many know, is um, you know, I, I clean up environmental contamination, <coughs> including sites that um, have PFAS, which up until a couple of years ago um, was legal to use. It was not thought to be an issue. Um, and so I, I, I have concerns about, you know, that, you know, really haven't been, um, you know, addressed. They, you know, I know we have a couple of 300 page documents. I did some flipping through, but um, I, I don't know that we've answered the fate and transport question <laughs> in groundwater adequately. Um, and I, just honestly don't feel comfortable with, with pesticide application um, other than some cut and dab within the 100 foot buffer. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm at at the moment, unless we have more information about fate and transport and groundwater. Um, the other thing that I wanted to touch upon was that there are vernal pools and they have um, 100 foot buffer vernal pool habitats. And so I feel as though if we are, you know, if there's chemicals that are going to, you know, be in the leaf litter, um, you know, our salamanders and, and frogs and, you know, just really sensitive creatures, um, you know, I think we should keep chemicals or additional chemicals out of their habitat. Um, you know, so those are, I guess those are really um, the things that I've been thinking about. And, um, you know, without more concrete information about fate and transport and groundwater, um, I'm just not comfortable with um, spraying within the hundred foot buffer. Yeah, this is um, this is Anna. Thanks, Julie. I I also have a similar background. I worked on Superfund sites, um, and I I agree. If you work in this field a long time, you know there's a lot of there's a lot of um, unanswered questions uh, with uh, chemicals, especially as um, uh, Mr. Walsh pointed out, there, uh, there are a lot of gaps in, in toxicity testing. Um, amphibians are not tested generally. Uh, they try to, more recent testing is more thorough, but old testing is not. So I, I would agree um, that, you know, within the 100 foot buffer, um, 
due to the uncertainties, uh, I would recommend just the cut and dab and not anything else. Thank you, Anna and Julie. Any other commissioners have any questions or comments? So I think we're, Amy, I think we're at a point where we have to try and make some decisions if we'd like to kind of continue with the discussions or um, what is the pleasure of the commission? Is there a DEP number on this? Yes. D DEP had no comments, objections to the project other than just noting that if they're working at Harvard, they need to notify Harvard. Okay. 100 feet of a wetland in Harvard. Okay. Yeah, I just saw that on the agenda. It didn't have the DEP number in it. Okay. Yeah, it just came in after the agenda. Um, it kind of sounds like the consensus of some of the people on the board that the cut and dab would be the limit for the 100 foot buffer, besides pulling the stuff up. But if you start pulling it up by the roots, you're going to leave bare ground. Where you, maybe you'd want to have a bunch of wetland seeding the seeds you could throw down that would sprout back in to make quite a step maintaining the ground. Yeah, we can um, put the soil, you know, tamp the soil back, and it kind mm -hmm. of depends on how much we're pulling up. If we would, you know, seed immediately or wait to see how it looks. Carl or Andrew or Kyle or Brian? So I would I would go with the hundred foot buffer, stay out of that as, as well as the hundred foot buffer around the vernal pools. You mean stay out allow the cut and dab, Kyle? Yes, allow cut and dab. Yeah, I'm in agreement with that as well. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I've not to beat a dead horse or be repetitive, but I'm the same with Julie. And Anna, I have the same background, and I just don't trust what we, as much as we think we know about this stuff, what we might not know in the future of putting this into a zone two well area. My, my concerns lay, um, as many of you, for drinking water for our town and also uh, protection of the vernal pools. I really don't think 100 is even remotely enough for, for protection for, for, the, uh, for them. And I would also agree with that. It sounds like cut and dab within that buffer zone is uh, most appropriate. Brian? Uh, pulling? Yep, I, I would agree with that. Um, and Laura, you had said within the 50 was, was going to be mechanical only, correct? No, cut and dab and then mechanical. Oh, cut and dab and mechanical. Yeah. If you pull it... But right, we can I certainly mean, do that with, you know, within the 100 and, and we'll, you know, definitely document how that's going. What are you going to do with what you've dabbed and then pull? What are you going to do with the roots? No, we won't pull what we've dabbed because it should just die in the ground. And then we would just pull anything, any of the smaller growth or re-sprouts. I would hope to cut and dab on the stump or would probably kill the roots anyway. That's the idea. So we, we've had a lot of discussion tonight and I think it would be nice to have some clarity of, of where we are right now. So um, whether we are talking nothing in the zero to 50, nothing in the 50 to 100. So if we'd like to back up a few spaces and kind of go forward with what is actually being proposed through the discussion this evening. So it sounds to me, um, and I'm willing to do this, is to only use cut and dab in the 100 foot buffer and no spraying. The 100 to 50? Zero to 100. Zero to 100. Yeah, I, I wouldn't support the zero to 50. Yeah, and I'm with Sarah. I, I, I guess I thought that's. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, so what I'm saying is we could do it from zero to a hundred would be no spraying. 
that would just be cut and dab and then mechanical. Can we clarify with what we're dabbing with in the zero to 50? It's triclopyr for ultra. It's on the sensitive materials list. Yeah, I, I would not support that. Yeah, not I agree. I, I would feel Ooh, more wow. comfortable with nothing, no, no chemical application in the zero to 50 because it will get into the roots. The roots could extend into the, the wetland area. Um, and then in addition, the, the vernal pools should be treated separately. The, you know, but as Sarah kind of was um, describing, there's the vernal pool and then there's a hundred foot vernal pool habitat. And then there's a hundred foot buffer around the hundred foot <laughs> vernal pool habitat. So I think we need to look at the vernal pools a little differently. Um, you know, and basically have no chemicals within a hundred feet of a vernal pool because that's the vernal pool habitat. That's the area where the amphibians are going to go to, um, you know, become mature adults. Um, and so what I would propose is nothing in the zero to 50, nothing in the hundred foot vernal pool habitat, and then cut and dab in the 50 to 100 um, wetland buffer. I would, I would agree with Julie. Yeah. I agree with that as well. I agree. So are we talking a 200 foot buffer around the vernal or 100 foot buffer? Well, depending on where, you're, where the vernal pool is, you might have a limited jurisdiction. I, I think a I think hundred. That'd be my feeling on it. Well, if 100 feet is the habitat itself, that would be the minimum. Right. Um, maybe another uh -huh. 25 or 50 feet around that. I think you would treat it. Are we at the wells? At the wells are 150 or 120? 125. 125. So for consistency, I would at least like the vernals to be the same as a well. 125 foot from the vernal pool or from the vernal pool habitat? Habitat. So 225 from the vernal pool. Carl, you're saying that you're happy with just 100? Well, a lot of that's going to be outside jurisdiction. Uh, right. Uh, right. I, I am, but I'd, be, but I'd be fine with the 125 for consistency. Are the vernals plotted on that last map that we were looking at, Laura? Yes, yes, the wetland delineation is there for those those pools. Okay. I've got to run everybody. Have a good night. Thanks, Andrew. Okay. Hi, Andrew. Bye, Andrew. Good night. I guess I in my mind I just thought to make clear we have this stated exactly what we're talking about because we keep bouncing around a right. little bit so our jurisdiction ends at 200 feet from the vernal pool basically right because it's the 100 foot habitat and then a 100 foot buffer it right. depends where the vernal pool is you mean like if it's if not the, in harvard if, if the vernal pool is in the middle of uplands you might not have jurisdiction at all right depending okay. on where the buffer zone is you might not have that far of a reach, but I, I think SVT would probably be willing to, to honor it, but. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would appeal to, you know, SVT and, you know, Laura have done, you know, some, some real heavy lifting and a lot of diligence in this effort, um, you know, so I would just appeal to, you know, a best, best practices, um, you know, I know they know the value of a vernal pool you know, whether it's within appropriate jurisdiction or not. So I guess I would ask to protect the vernal pool habitat and then at least 50 feet around the habitat line. Um, and when you say habitat line, you mean the 100 foot buffer? So there's the vernal pool itself, the line of the vernal pool and, the, and then the vernal pool habitat is 100 feet surrounding the vernal at pool. At least. Right. The regulatory. Yeah. Habitat is right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. So yeah, the the intent is to protect the species, right? You know, and 
and the, the insects that are going to feed the reptiles and amphibians. And, you know, so the intent is to protect it. Right. So I just wanted to make sure I understood what distances we were talking about. Exactly. I would ask for 150 to 200. From the? From the edge of the vernal pool. Thank you. And that's no use of herbicide at all. Correct. Correct. And is that, that's basically an ask that that's going to be outside the buffer zone, but that's basically just an ask for SVT to honor it, basically. It's the same way with the wells. Mm -hmm. So, Laura, I'm not sure that's a decision you can make on, on their behalf. So, in the essence of time, I think we've had good dialogue tonight, if that... Um, on the, uh, I can make the decision, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> yes, I can. Um, and I think I understand what you're saying. So, Amy, do you want to provide those numbers precisely so we know that everyone is in agreement? I just froze, so I missed a, a Oops. So, Laura, that, that would be you presenting that. So. Okay, thank you. Yep. <laughs> I'll do that. Because so, what I understand is from the w edge of the wetland to the 100-foot buffer. No, wait. Yes. Again, the edge of the wetland to the 50 feet would be no from the Beaver Brook marshes is no use of herbicides at all. From 50 feet to 100 is cut and dab only on the Beaver Brook marshes side. And then for the vernal pool wetlands, I think you said no use of herbicide 200 feet from the edge of the Vernal pool. 125, wasn't it? No, 200. 200. And with mechanical being a possibility in all those areas. So what we'll try. So as a point of order, is that being what is being presented and you would like the commission to vote on that or yeah, because otherwise, um, I mean, I think that's what I understand that you would be interested in approving. And I would like to move forward with something. So, Well, we, we, we need something to either yay or nay on. So we that's what you would now. So that is the modified proposal. What I just said. Okay. Correct. So Thank now you. we would ask commissioners what their feeling is in support of that or not. And if you did not have support, then you could continue to have dialogue because you're not, you could take a straw poll right now and not close it. Um, James, what would you like to do? It sounds reasonable and it's within our jurisdiction. I thought we, there was concerns about putting any herbicide pesticide within the 100 foot buffer at all the whole conversation that we just went through with Julie was no cutting and painting within the buffer zone at all. But did I miss something? You're, you're, uh, you're correct. And that's why I thought we would take the straw poll because I think we're, we're very split right now because I think um, that was part of the discussion, Kyle, you're correct. I, th I thought Julie, but that's not what SVT is presenting. Correct. All right. So let me switch it. Cause I misunderstood then. <laughs> So no. That's what I was afraid of. I, I kind of just want to be able to close it and move on. Um, so as I understand it, no uh, herbicides within the 100 foot. Is that what you were thinking, Kyle? That is what, Kyle. That's my preference. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead and that is what is presented. Carl, are you still on? Yes. Okay, let's go. James, you want to just do a roll call then? 
for and he'll, well, he'll, the motion would also need to issue the waiver as well as the order of conditions. What the waiver would be for the zero to 50. Right, which is mechanical work. Okay. Are you still looking to do a straw poll or is this an actual vote? Uh, it's James, what are your you thoughts? You might as well make a motion and go forward with it. That's what it seems like Laura wants to do. Okay, do we have someone that would like to make a motion or follow Laura's motion? I'd like to make a motion to move forward with what has been discussed as far as the honey foot with no uh, chemicals. And they would also be allowed to use the mechanical within the, up to the, in the first hundred feet, first hundred feet. I think I may be screwed up on that a little bit, but you got to do something in that 50 foot buffer too, if you're trying to get that stuff out of there. Okay, do we have a second? I'll second. I think you have to add the vernal pool bit yeah. though. That yeah, includes yeah. 200 feet. It was, I think what James was doing was reiterating what Laura had said. So we would go by what Laura had said uh, a few minutes prior with the 200 feet with the vernal and then the protection of the wells as well. The 125 or 120 with the wells. Well, the wells are outside your jurisdiction anyway. They all, oh, I thought one was closer. Okay. But, but that is what's on there. But yeah, so the wells are 125. Might as well just state it too. Right. Did someone second that? I forget. Yep, I did. Brian. Brian did. Okay. All right, should we have a roll call? Sure. Uh, Cal Melberg, yes. Brian Crowley. Brian Crowley, yes. Kyle Maxfield. Kyle Maxfield, aye. Sarah Seward. Sarah Seward, no. James Pickard. Aye. James Pickard, yes. Julie Rupp. Uh, Julie Rupp, aye. Okay. So five to one, the order conditions issued. Yep. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your discussion. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thanks very Thank you, Laura. much. Okay, last hearing of the evening is um, Notice of Intent 80 Air Road. <coughs> we do not have the number R15-21-0, construction of new silos, restoration of railroad siding and construction of rail car storage area and three new groundwater monitoring wells. Kevin, are you here? Uh, yeah, hold on. Okay. okay. Um, so yeah, um, continued from November 2nd, um, the commission had asked for some additional documentation, um, some maintenance records. Um, but I think we, we got, you know, what the site manager has for records. Um, I think we I sent that over to Amy, I think earlier today, hopefully everybody got a chance to look at it. Um, uh, there probably wasn't much to look at um not very extensive but um again that's what they had um and then you know based on the site walks that we had um with i think most of the commissioners between friday and today um you know there are just a number of uh comments i guess that i heard um seemingly mostly regarded to you know the site operations on um, you know storage of materials and uh, kind of maintenance activities, especially related to the stormwater management facilities. So, um, you know, I guess I'd just like to kind of, um, uh, actually, uh, Amy, you had um, mentioned on, uh, I think it was Friday, um, you had pointed out just some of the accumulated sand kind of in the parking lot area. Um, I saw them while we were out there today, it looked like they were at least starting to get into cleaning that up, um, getting that out of there. I don't know exactly how far they got, but um, 
So I'd just like to, I guess, hear from the commissioners um, kind of what some of the, I guess, specific concerns are. Um, I'm sorry, can, you, can you hang on one second? I'm not sure who you, you, BBWW is who just got admitted. I have no idea who that is. Um, Amber, can they be taken back out and can you find out who that is? Is that a possibility? Uh, I can kick them out, but they can't come back in and they just left. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Sorry, Kevin. Uh, no worries. Um, so, um, you know, I guess our, the, our, our client is uh, willing and, and ready to, I guess, you know, make any repairs or, um, you know, do any of the maintenance that's needed um, to bring those, you know, management, stormwater management structures and swales and basins uh, kind of back up to where they should be. So, um, you know, just kind of hoping to here are the commission's, you know, some of your specific concerns um, so we can, you know, start to address those issues. Amy, did you receive Kevin's data from today? I, I did. I haven't even looked at it. Right. So, Kevin, that's a, that's a challenge that we went through today, that when things aren't submitted last week, the commissioners don't have a chance to review that. Um, we do have, I believe, a change of this request by removal of the rail as well. So um, what has been submitted uh, would be changed as well. Um, I would like to go over, Kevin, I think we've had enough um, people on site, which we've been really fortunate to have enough eyes on the property. I know for me, I have some concerns. I know the history of the facility. And I, I think we need to address not only what we're gonna do for new construction, but also to really talk about drainage um, I have deep concerns with the storage um, and uh, impeding into um, basically sitting on top of the siltation. Um, I have concerns for some of the wetlands as well and lack of maintenance. So um, we have quite a few photos. Uh, we also have some aerials as well, um, but you've been out on site and all of us have been out on site. So. Um, I would just like to express some of my concerns with the condition of the property and the intense uh, use that it's getting right now. I know that you all that were there on Friday saw it during the, during the rain. Um, today, we certainly saw it during the wind, but we got to see the remnants of water coming um, into what I feel is an inferior basin. Uh, if I can just jump in there, I, I think the design of the basin is adequate. I think it's just like you, a couple of you have pointed out, it's um, very likely um, just lack of maintenance. So it's probably very likely silted up um, in some spots. So it's probably just not functioning properly. Um, so I, again, I, I don't think it was necessarily a design issue. I think it was a, um, a maintenance issue or in, and then in this case, lack of maintenance potentially. Well, I think going forward, if you're having a change of use, then you need to change the drainage as well. Okay. Um, commissioners want to comment on what they saw on some of their walks, if they had any concerns or any concerns for the, um, to address with the applicant. Uh, sure. So um, I'd, I'll echo Sarah's concerns regarding the, um, the large amount of storage and um, specifically metal, rusted metal items that will contribute um, iron and other metals, you know, into the, into the um, drainages and uh, high groundwater. Um, so that's a concern. And then I also observed, so on our way out, we observed um, a couple cement trucks being loaded by that hopper, um, which was really neat to see. I was actually surprised it was as neat as it was. I expected to see more dust. Um, so that's a that's a good thing. Um, and then I saw it drive forward to an area where there is a depression and then the truck got very much sprayed down um, for several, min several minutes. And so I was wondering, where does that water go? 
Kevin, um, if you want to address that, and Julie, we saw the exact same today, but we saw it on a different day and we did see all the dust today. Okay, so maybe the rain helped. Um, yep. Kevin, that. do you want to talk about the underground structure? Um, well, I'm not, um, Julie, I'm just trying to uh, make sure we're talking about the same spot. You know, they drive kind of from where we walked up, they drive into that bay, get loaded up, and were you talking they drove through? into a depression or yeah they, they drove through down? direct they drove through you know pulled forward maybe 20 or 30 feet and then hosed the truck down so was it up uh, up that little rise a little bit and then yeah it was um up against the little wall that's there. The, yeah the elbow yeah, so um the, so that's um that's the intended that's what they're supposed to do in that area and all that runoff runs towards that wall um gets captured and then it's pumped back up into the plant to be used in the uh, concrete mixtures. So all that's be not running off anywhere. All that's being captured and recycled and used in the uh, concrete plant. Okay. And then one thing we also noticed, um, you know, so the this silt sacks adjacent to the Jersey barrier, you know, some were very much buried, um, you know, not, not really in good shape, you know, so that was something, um, you know, that I noticed and it did look like there's quite a bit of drainage as we saw in that puddle that we stepped over, um, quite a bit of drainage down to the, you know, basically one inflection point where there's the break in the Jersey barriers and then um, the, there's a detention basin right after that. And it looked like there was definitely some breakthrough happening. I don't know if it was underneath or over, um, but it seems like there's some breakthrough of silt happening there. And then it was it, the detention basin itself, um, the color, there, there was a lot of silt for the amount of rain, which wasn't much at that point in the day. It, it just really looked very, very silted in. Um, so I'm just concerned that there's you know, concrete dust or, you know, other things making it in there that, um, you know, are, are not impacting the environment well. It, you know, concrete has a high pH. You can get really high pH water if you have, um, you know, concrete kind of sitting there. Um, so there are just some concerns around that. And I don't know if I didn't get a chance to look very closely. I did skim through what you sent. Um, but I didn't know if there was any pH data on any of the, the samples or if you sample that basin or, um, you know, so if you could speak to some of those, that would help. Yeah, um, so as far as, you know, sampling, uh, you know, for pH, um, I don't know if they do any of that. I'll definitely look into it. Um, I do know they, it seems like they have a, uh, NIPTI's permit, um, from what I could find out, it looks like the last inspection was 2016. Um, I'm still trying to find out a little bit more exactly, you know, what that inspe inspection entailed and, you know, if there was a report or anything that went with it or who it was even submitted to. Um, so, you know, I can certainly try and find out more about, you know, the pH and if there's sampling going on. Um, but, when was the silo, Adam, do you know when the silo was completed? Uh, sorry, sir. When was the silo completed? The batch plant. Right. Sorry. Yep. Um, I know it, uh, it was before the commission in 2016. Um, so obviously since then, I don't know exactly when. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it was, was just, you know was just, right after if they waited a little while. So I was curious when that report, if that report was submitted after completion of the construction or not. So I do have to say that, and um, Brian and Kyle can probably attest to this as well. We saw multiple breaches um, through erosion control and barriers today, um, for sure. And we also have a, a section in the bank that's undermined tremendously in, into the pond. And there was a Tremendous amount of siltation today. Yeah. So, um, just to address the rest of uh, Julie's um, comments, that kind of mirrored some of those. Um, you know, we can 
we're here to, you know, kind of find the remedies uh, for some of those issues. Um, there, there are, you know, definitely some, some issues out there. Um, so, yeah, we can definitely have them kind of reset those Jersey barriers. I'm um, sure the diversion channels um, that are supposed to be directing the stormwater where they're supposed to go. Um, the detention basin, um, you know, we can work to come up with a plan to, uh, you know, hopefully, I guess, drain, dewater, remove the sediment from that. Um, you know, we can, uh, we'll try and put something together, I guess, um, to address that issue. And then the, um, the silt sacks, I know, um, I know that's one of those things in their maintenance records um, and talking with the site manager, it sounds like they, they do check those and replace those, replace those periodically. Um, as you can see, you know, they do get a lot of use out there. Um, a lot of uh, siltation running off into them. So it could just be time to replace those anyways. Um, but, you know, that's something we can definitely have them, you know, do more frequently if needed. Um, okay. Because I, I did not have an opportunity to see what was submitted. Can you tell us what's been going on for, you know, maintenance in the last say year, two, three years, like when was the last time the silt sacks were inspected? Do that that report shows them being replaced on the 11th, Sarah, which is a little concerning to me. If they were replaced on the 11th and then you observed them when? Friday? Like that's not a very long time for them to be fully silted in again if they were truly replaced. Right. So um, one thing I'd like to bring up, Kevin, which is more kind of from an immediate standpoint, is site control. Um, the erosion controls are ineffective, especially when you have um, large equipment on top of them. So I think going forward, you need to come to us and, and basically let us know in the next, hopefully a couple of days, what we can do to get the site stable as well, because I don't consider the amount of runoff that's coming off that site to be safe and stable. Um, do you have any, I guess, just to kind of make sure I'm on the same page to pass on, um, when you say equipment in the, you know, on top of the controls. Um, Amy, Amy, do you have any of those pictures that I sent you? No, I don't. I can't okay. get to them. Um, Bear with me. Yes, sir. You guys keep chatting. I'll see if uh, I have. Were you, were, um, were you referring to the uh, up along the access road that we walked up? I was referring to the tugboat sitting on top of the erosion controls. Yeah, it was. It was the heavy equipment headed out towards the four bay, to the, oh, the what the, the east of the site. I don't actually know how I can share these. Um, yeah, and. I'm wondering myself, I kind of just sitting here thinking about it with the, uh, I'm not sure how much that equipment comes and goes, but the, um, the oils and greases that come off that equipment, I mean, that type of equipment requires a lot of lubrication. I hadn't even thought much about that until, until I started thinking how much equipment's actually sitting in that lot. Well, there's equipment. Some of the booms are actually sitting <laughs> in the wetlands. Yeah, one of the booms of one of those rigs was extended out through the, the tree line of, of the wetland resources. I'm sorry, they're on my desktop, but I can't share them for some reason. So, um, but, but Kevin, um, you, Kevin, I you just, literally... Uh, I, I heard the, the comment about the boom earlier, and I was kind of curious about that, too. Um, I know the, uh, the wetlands, you know, the, the edge of that pavement, kind of where those were... Um, it's kind of either right at or right outside the 50 foot buffer zone. Um, so, you know, there, it, the boom's definitely extending off the pavement towards the wetlands. Um, I don't think it was, you know, over by 50 feet, um, but just. You're, you're in a race. Yeah. I shouldn't be doing that anyways, but. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Fair. Yeah. It might not have extended sure past the flags. It's not, you know, in the wetlands, but certainly going towards it.
Sorry, I'm not mm -hmm. able to share these, but I can certainly email them around. This, this works. Sarah, you should be able to point it out here. There's the 2019 maybe. aerial photograph I just put up. Yep. All of these down here is new. I went back through, I don't know, 2000, late 1990s, and there had not been that kind of massing. There had been parking along here. Some stuff, you know, right along the edge, but but not this kind of massing in the buffer zone riverfront area. So I guess what um just I guess to kind of address some of those concerns, I guess would the commission want to see that equipment, you know, moved outside that area? Is that Kevin, I think at the very least, at least move the equipment off of the erosion controls that are in place back there. Sure. Yeah. Well, and also going back to um, the rust and the mobilization of, you know, just small, small particles that, you know, may carry metals into the wetlands, um, you know, it, that very well may be causing an impact. Um, and then it seemed like, I don't know if it was marine, but it looked like there was some biofouling. I'm assuming it was marine, but if it's fresh water, then there's concerns for introducing, you know, species to the vicinity. I'm guessing it's marine though, based on um, the large size. But. Well, that's, that's a good point, Julie, because we don't know where those, um... Poseidon barges come and go from? I can, I can definitely uh, ask them and find out. Hey, um, so I assume you want those barges at least 10 feet off the erosion controls so you can get in there and sweep. Right, it's not just the barges on the far end closer to the rail, you have the pontoons that are literally on top of the surveying stakes. When Kevin, when we first walked in and we went all the way to the right, when we walked through, they're literally on top of the erosion control. So they're leaning so that they actually are your erosion control, but you're leaching. So they're all yeah. metal. Like oh, sorry, uh, where are you talking about? To the right? Correct. Past uh, over towards your batching. When we first came in, uh, we keep went going, over. Keep going, Amy, west. further. Yep, oh, keep going up in that corner where Amy is. Your cursor is now that whole area. Yeah, kind of down along the, along the access road. Yeah. yeah, it was all the big metal studs for their barges. They just yeah. strewn about there. Yep. So I think from a consistency standpoint, they need to... I would say I would love for them not to stockpile anything within 10 feet of the erosion control at minimum and refresh the whole erosion line to start. Do we have any sort of what? I mean, I know for like stockpiling, you can't stockpile soils within 10 feet of the riverfront line. Well, this seems like it's just as big of a, could be just as big of a problem if you're having heavy equipment, heavy machinery being parked <laughs> within this, this area. Do we have any control or concern over that? Well, I think you have to go back to the planning board and see what was originally permitted. Um, I brought this up probably about, I don't know, 10 years ago, um, but the encroachment has um, certainly gone on a wider scale at this point. But yeah, I don't think you should be able to stockpile metal. I think, Kevin, something that might help you speak to your client. Um, they are, as you mentioned, certainly subject to the NIPTES stormwater. I don't know if they're sector specific or even 
even the multi-sector general permit has some really minimal requirements such as um, monthly inspection, written monthly inspection reports, quarterly um, monitoring and sampling for things that are that could be contributed by your facility, such as, you know, in this site would be, you know, metals, the, the high pH, um, TSS, you know, things like that. Um, you know, so at a, at a minimum, um, the way to get out of having to conduct the quarterly sampling is to have at least four quarters of favorable results, and then you can reduce um, reduce the monitoring. And then there's also aquatic toxicity. That's you know a, a sample holding time of like two hours. Um, so, like it it seems to me that if there if there are no records of the monitoring, like that that is where you would catch. Oh, hey, all these rusty barges are contributing metals you know, to the watershed. And that's, that's where you would catch that, you know, in your runoff, you would sample your stormwater runoff. Um, so it seems to me, that would be a great place for them to start. And that would address our issues. And frankly, if they're out of compliance with the NIPTI stormwater permit, they're, they're out of compliance with the Clean Water Act. Um, you know, so I think getting, you know, I don't know if your firm does stormwater or if they have someone else they would have do that. Um, I really think they need to get on top of that and that would really help, um, you know, with with the concerns we have with impacts to the environment. Sure, yeah, I'll, um, I'll definitely look into that, pass it on. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if we will necessarily handle that but um definitely uh pass along that info and you know get them up to uh the part with the nippies permit so right now you're not in so I, I think we just have to be clear kevin that right now the site is not in compliance so regardless of going forward and looking at other things the site needs to get cleaned up Understood. So we meet again on November 30th. Um, what would the commissioners like for feedback in terms of what's going to go on in terms of monitoring, cleaning, sweeping, basically everything that should be in the report from 2016? Amy, if you have a chance, can you pull the planning permit plan again that was pulled a long time ago? Yeah. Because Kyle, that would help answer, you know, whether it was supposed to be truck storage or outside storage. I, it certainly wasn't meant to be permanent storage. Right. I, I'm sure you could argue that it's not permanent storage, but I don't think... I don't care if it's for 30 days. Like you saw, you saw the amount of the muscle for the muscle shell or clam shells that had fallen off of that barge that were there. Never mind <laughs> the biology, biological stuff that was probably falling off of it. And then the metals, like Julie said. It, yeah, I think there are immediate concerns that there the site is impacting water quality in the media, in the immediate vicinity, and so sweeping, cleaning up the site. Um, I don't know if they can get some of the metal pieces under cover, um, move, you know, move them out of the area, ideally. Um, you know, they, they have a responsibility to not have detrimental impacts on, you know, the surface and groundwater in the area. I think part of the issue, Julie, is we don't, we also don't know where a lot of that equipment originates from. So who knows what they're who knows what they're bringing onto the site that's sitting there next to right the wetlands. 
Well, and if they if they're hosing that equipment down, if they're hosing any equipment down that goes to stormwater, that's that's technically a wastewater discharge to stormwater. Um, you know, so there there's some definite concerns. I've certainly seen some spray of different trucks driving by. So, Kevin, I think we've started to let you know this is a big deal. Yep. I can, um, I'll, you know, let them know first thing tomorrow morning, uh, all your concerns. What um, we'll do is we'll compile um, our photos so that you can share so they're aware of what we saw on site yep. and immediate actions. Immediate actions is really erosion control, removal of equipment that are on the actual line. Um, you're not allowed to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, like I said at the beginning, um, they're ready uh, and willing to do kind of anything they need to. Um, like I said, Amy, you had said on uh, Friday at the walk, you know, if somebody could get out there and start to remove that sediment. Um, you know, when we were out there, we saw somebody starting to, um, and that was just based on just a comment uh, to the site manager. So I think um, once I kind of reinforced the, importance of some of these things i think they'll so what i saw right today was they were power grooming into the resource area so they were basically cleaning the parking area and power grooming the metals and everything in towards the grass so that's what i saw today so it's supposed to go the other way i'll uh, i'll reinforce that so then it was nice enough to stop while we walked by Sarah, though. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. <laughs> in big wave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I do agree. And that's something like, I mean, in, it's not his fault. He probably, you know, he doesn't know any better, but yeah. it's just, he, somebody told him to go sweep the parking lot. And that's what he did. He was power. Yeah, I, I just brought right that up to, um, just to, you know, they're, they're, re they're ready to jump on um, kind of anything they need to do. You know, they, they want to, keep things moving forward as quickly as possible. And, you know, I'm sure they're going to take these comments, these concerns um, seriously and, you know, start to make some changes. So does the commission wish to give Kevin some guidance in terms of what needs to be done quickly versus long-term, a little bit more long-term? I had those two things, moving the equipment off the erosion controls and a minimum of 10 feet away, redoing the whole erosion control line, and then maybe slightly more long-term is uh, inspect, repair the stormwater features as needed, and look at the Nippity's permit records, monthly, quarterly, quarterly sampling results, stuff like that. Right. I think it would be nice to have them monitor the silt sacks daily so that we know how impacted they are based on the amount of work that's going on. If there is someone there to do that, I know it's hard because there was a manager that was there for a very long time who's no longer there. Yeah, but even just to get ahead of that, I mean, that's, that whole site, I think it just needs to be swept, like a, a street cleaning sweep. I mean, you saw it, Sarah, today. You guys had rain on private today. That wind was whipping through there, and it was nothing but dust. And not not saying it was concrete dust or any cement, but just dust and sand blowing right into the detention basin and towards oh, the train yeah. tracks. Yeah, um, like you you wanted goggles on today. Yeah. <laughs> so whether, yeah, whether it's you, you start with sweeping and then water control, something that is... It's, it's a simple step like that, right? That would help. That would reduce clogging your silt sacks because if that report was true and they re replaced them on the 11th, Friday was the 13th. That was only two days in between that they had been out there and you guys saw them silted in already. So that's... Uh, Kyle, do you think some of the dust might have been coming? They seem to stockpile sand and stuff up on the ramp that goes into the... Uh, oh, absolutely. area of our... Mixing where they put the sand and gravel. To yeah, go you're, to yeah, you're absolutely right. It's probably part of their stockpile, but I mean, that's not a good excuse, I guess. So then they need dust control of some sort. They need to. Right. It would have been very interesting to see what it was like this summer during the drought. So, okay. 
Kevin, can you report back to Amy by Wednesday? What's uh, happening and what the plan is? Monday. Um, yeah, I can I can report back kind of what uh, what my client wants. You know, I'll pass up everything on to them to them. Um, reinforce the importance and you know sensitive nature of it all. Um, reinforce that you know it's a time sensitive matter and um i can't you know, yeah I'll, I'll report back to amy and, and work with her okay because i think just to reiterate that it's a wetlands sensitive because there is wetlands impact negative impact that is yep. occurring presently okay all right any other questions for kevin or comments so my only, so sorry, I think I asked you this earlier. Where where does all this come in into play with as far as the order they had apparently is it expired is expired and we obviously haven't given a new one for the work they want to do. How what is all this falling under? Amy, uh, we'll need a certificate of compliance for the the expired order of conditions, and then if. I, I would assume that if this isn't done satisfactorily, the commission would, would look at an enforcement order. Okay. So the, the site was the original work from 2016 wasn't closed out. There was no. Yeah, it was partially done, but, but the reason they're, they're, they're back is because they, they want to finish off what it, but expired. Okay. Yeah, that was a, that was a question I had and I think you just answered it, but um, since the original order expired, you guys can still issue the COC on that, correct? Yes. Okay. We just need application. Sounds like you've already got an as built. Um, we'll go from there. Sure. I would stress to you though, Kevin, that going forward, we would be looking at drainage under the new filing. Yep, understood. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all for your time. Yep. Thanks, Kevin. Commissioners, have anything else? Thanks, Amy, do you have anything? Uh, yeah, so on the budget, I, I owe that um, to Cheryl. Uh, I think either a, a vote to approve that, uh, and I'll put in some money for signs, or if you wanted to look at that again, if I even have it. Yeah. Now, I move that we accept the budget as presented. Um, Second. Would you add just the signs, a bit of budget money for signs? I'll, I'll try to figure something out and then see how far it gets us. Okay. You could call it outreach if slash we, if signs. We do dog hoop signs, you're looking at at least 20, 25 signs. Okay. Well, let, let's stress to the selectmen that we're looking for numerous types of signs, ag okay. signs, dog signs. Outreach signs, such as your dog poop impacts or nutrifies our lakes and makes it so we can't swim. <laughs> okay. Do we have a second for Outreach. <laughs> my motion to accept the budget that Amy has presented? I oh, second it. Oh. Okay, perfect. Do you want All to right. roll call? Sure. Um, Carl Melberg, yes. Brian Crowley? Brian Crowley, yes. Kyle Maxfield? Kyle Maxfield, aye. Sarah Seward. Sarah Seward, aye. James Pickard. James Pickard, aye. Julie Rupp. Julie Rupp, aye. Yeah, unanimous. And then did you want to set a site walk for Cooper? Um, I think we left it that we were going to go by ourselves. We can do it together, whatever you guys want to do. I think it doesn't hurt to go together. Seems like it might be a good idea to have Matt there at some point. I, I, I think I think that site might be better if we do it together rather than separate. I do it tomorrow before it's blistering cold on Wednesday. Uh, I, I might have a, I might have a little trouble unless it's later in the day. Later in the day, it's fine. Go early. What time is it? Yeah, because it gets late at like six thirty. I could go early. It's dark by five. Right. Oh, 
Well, like early. Do, like a, no? Okay. Like 7.30? You're on your own. Okay. <laughs> Eight. Eight. It's at 11 o'clock at night for Amy. Yeah. Noon. Tomorrow, I, what time? So, Julie, can well, you do tomorrow afternoon or no? I think so. Tomorrow? I'm sure I can, yeah. Brian? I could do tomorrow afternoon, yep. Somebody throw a timeout. Can I make a comment from back a little wait, bit? Wait a minute. Wait, let's yeah. figure out what time we're going to meet tomorrow at Cooper. Somebody throw a timeout. Four. Four o'clock. Yeah, that works for me. Yep. Four o'clock it is. But I think in particular you want to look at how much lawn you want them to be leave left with. Yeah. And I would love to just go walk on lot 20 as well. Yeah. So where, where, where are we going to meet? We'll meet at 12, 13. So that's that's coming in on which which road? By the house. The, the furthest west one. So by, just, by, by the house? Yeah, turn by the house and it's just like straight in front. They were they were paving there today. So they're they're actively okay. working. Gotcha. Thanks. Okay. So four o'clock would be great. James, you had something else? I uh, My observation on the Middlesex site was that the water was not moving the other day when I was there. They're just still, which yeah, kind of surprised me. It was definitely impounded in areas. Brian and Kyle, we saw that today. It was it was very gapped. Yep. But I, I think that's because it doesn't have any maintenance. But I was thinking more about the brook that was coming from under the tracks and down that I noticed it just wasn't moving on Friday. Right. It was pretty full today. Well, there's beavers there, though, because I crawled down, and there's beavers. Oh, again, the railroad needs to come back again, huh? Clean them out? There, I mean, there's there was there a lot of sign of beavers today. The other side of the tracks was really flooded this spring. Okay. I just want to note that we are still having a tracking problem at Nine Air Road. Yeah, they need they really need need a daily sweep. Um, yeah, I talked to Michael about that today. I sent him an email Friday whenever you're out there, and uh, I talked to Michael today, and um, they they will start doing more daily sweeps. He said a lot less water is going down there because the improvements or the repairs that Mass Highway did uh, or DOT did, um, but. We went around circle, but they need to shovel that out and, and clean it up every day. Their their site boundary and their curb is also their watershed boundary and their stormwater boundary. Um, and so if if that if they're going to track out, they need to change their stormwater boundary yeah. or their watershed boundary to include the crown of the road. I went by there today, and I was amazed at how deep the cut is now. It's really into the bank. I mean, it's getting down towards the road level. Right. I think we're going to be shocked. It's going to go lower. All right. I'm going to make a motion to adjourn at 10.59. So do you want to wait a second? And we'll, we'll just make sure it's 11? No, because I think that'll screw up Amber. Okay. Oh, Sorry, Amber. <laughs> second. We already hit the four hours. Okay. That's true. Yeah. Roll call, Kyle Melberg, aye. Brian Crowley. Brian Crowley, aye. Kyle Maxfield. Kyle Maxfield, aye. Sarah Seward. Sarah Seward, aye. James Pickard. James Pickard, aye. And Julie Rupp. Julie Rupp, aye. Good night, Paul. Happy Thanksgiving, if you don't.